Welcome to Yahoo Finance Live. I'm Shawna Smith alongside Brad Smith and Brian Sazi. We're just five minutes away from the January jobs report. Let's talk about the expectations first. When it comes to that headline number, 185,000 jobs are expected to be added to the U.S. economy. Now, that would be a tick lower than what we got in December when that reading coming in at 216,000. Investors also forecasting, or the street forecasting here, unemployment to tick up one-tenth of a percent to 3.8 percent. Hourly wages expected to come in under changed at least on that year-over-year basis. Average hourly earnings on a year-over-year basis expected to come in at 4.1%. Now, on a month-over-month basis, we are expecting to see it tick down just a bit to a three-tenths of a percent rise here. But guys, when we talk about the fact that this is a very important number, when we think about everything we just heard from Powell earlier this week and what exactly or how this could potentially factor into the Fed's decision, next decision. Yeah, I'm going to bring up the labor force participation rate. The backdrop here, of course, is that in the most recent reading, we had seen 62.5%. We'll see if that moderates higher a little bit here. But of course, some of the layoffs that have come forward over the start of this year might be in the minds of some of our viewers here, and no doubt trying to get a read through of how that may impact everything from the headline print all the way through to that participation rate. I think more interestingly, Gargi from uh, Gargi Chowdhury from BlackRock had a note out earlier this week talking about the trend of job growth as well. That was interesting, believing that the three month moving average of job growth currently at 165,000 is going to continue to show normalization in the labor market. We'll see where that shows up in this headline figure. And, and Sean, I think you brought up a, a very good point here. What does this jobs report mean to a Federal Reserve that really pushed back uh, last uh, this earlier this week on what they may or may not do with interest rates? A lot of folks on the street were looking for a March rate cut, but now that might be May sometime in the summer. So if this report comes in hot, you could theoretically see uh, some form of pressure on the market. And that's what one of my charts here shows. It is by 22V Research. A uh, really interesting survey calling out 50% of investors that they surveyed. There it is on the, uh, on the screen right there. 50% of investors believe employment data on Friday will be a risk-off environment. What does that mean in plain English? Well, if the jobs report comes in hot, stocks might actually sell off. So the next chart uh, I'm watching too as well, which kind of is counter to that narrative, is you're starting to see now a, a slowdown or a downtick in professional and business services and leisure and hospitality jobs, as you can see on there. And Brad, you've been covering the airlines, the hotels, you name it. That has been really the strong area of the labor market going on really two years as the economy uh, opens back up around the world. But if these jobs slow, what are we looking for uh, in terms of the labor market in the back half of this year? Yeah, certainly a, a number of good things here to keep in mind. And then we also got to bring up wages, right? When it comes to that inflation narrative, what exactly we are going to see in this print, like I said before, their ex expectations is for a bit of a downtick here of three tenths of a percent on a month over month basis increase. A year over year, though, expected to remain flat from the reading that we got last month, which is at 4.1 percent year over year increase. So you're seeing the fact that wage growth has moderated something that the Fed is closely watching here. I also want to bring up that second chart that we have, and it comes from ADP data and showing the fact that the gap that we're seeing between job switchers and those who stay in their current jobs that is narrowing and what this means for inflation, what this means for wages in particular. Obviously, we might not see as big of an uptick that we had seen going back to 2022, like you're seeing there on your screen in 2023, when the gap, early 2023, when the gap was much, much wider than where it is today. So any improvement there, meaning a moderation, further moderation of wages, at least the Fed is going to view that as good news. I'm glad because I'm actually thinking of a story, my next comment right here. And you mentioned inflation. I got to give a shout out to our uh, senior columnist, Rick Newman, really interesting story on our site that went live this morning on auto price inflation. Yeah. I mean, I don't know about you, my rates have gone through the roof, yeah. and I, I get it. Look, I drive sports cars, and I'm over 40 years old. I should be charged more. But nonetheless, auto inflation remains high. Shelter inflation remains high. And I think that's why the Fed this week pushed back on them cutting rates. So this is a market that doesn't want to see 250000 plus on headline jobs, as Goldman forecast. Well, anybody that likes to test out the zero to 60 as much as you do should have to pay a <laughs> higher I'm, insurance I'm trying premium. to drive home later without a ticket, Brad. All right? You never know who's watching this, all right? That's fair. Let's marry this with some of the areas, though, that investors are looking across and some of the analysts, the strategists that are looking for gains, particularly you think about financials uh, and how many times that's come up, but as well, health care, how that's been one of the plays that investors have put on our table and on our conversations as well. I'm going to be looking at health care specifically here because this is one area that's averaged 55000 per month in 2023 compared to the 2022 prior year average of 46000 So seeing where that continues to see more people entering into that particular sector as well. This never gets old. It's like a big number after even after all these years. I'm psyched. I can't wait. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs>
I know. So here we are here getting the numbers. Wow, look at that change in non-farm payrolls, 353,000 <laughs> blowing past expectations. Remember, the survey number was 185,000 unemployment rate holding steady at 3.7% from that prior reading. Now, that was lower than what the street had been anticipating here of a 3.8%. They were anticipating an increase in that unemployment rate numbers. Guys, I am shocked by this headline number here. Let's dig in. Well, I think the market's going to be shocked, too. Yeah, look, look, you see futures, uh, Sean. You see that futures give back just like we talked about. Yeah, exactly. And digging in here, let's take a look at some of these average hourly earnings month over month basis, increasing by six tenths of a percent, much hotter than what the street was looking for a year over year basis, an increase of four and a half percent higher, much higher than what we got last month of that 4.1 percent year over year basis. Labor force participation rate coming in at 62 and a half percent. We got to take a look at the futures and the reaction that we are seeing here to this much stronger than expected jobs report. I, this, these, this is just, I caution, this is just initial reactions. Yeah. They require, this requires a lot more digging uh, on what drove this massive upside. I'm looking at the report right now, professional and business services, like we just talked about ahead of the numbers, that was a downtrend, 74,000 jobs created in January. Healthcare rose 70,000 jobs. Maybe that's people preparing for the Ozempic wave and handing out a lot of shots, unclear to me. And then the retail trade up 45,000, which guys, to me, doesn't make a lot of sense because all we have heard uh, post holiday is layoffs sweeping the retail sector and the tech sector. So there's a lot to digest here. I think the larger question coming off of this and this hot print, uh, red hot print, is what the Fed does not only in March, but also now in May. Does it cast into question once again whether or not there will actually be a cut that comes forward in May? If you've got a Fed that is more willing to continue to hang its hat on the employment situation and continue combating inflation. Worth, and let me, let me just add here, too, we also got two upward revisions to uh, the prior month's data. November revised up by 9,000. December revised up by 117,000. So it wasn't this report just blew away market expectations. Really, now you're getting a picture that the labor market perhaps accelerated into your end? Well, and, and this is what's very surprising here, I think, to the street, to investors out there who have been following this story, because there was a real focus on some of those revisions that we were going to get ahead of this print. But the thought process there was, hey, maybe the jobs market had cooled faster than what the initial headline numbers had reflected. But when you take a look at these revisions, a revision to the upside there showing the exact opposite, that, hey, the jobs market much hotter than what we had been anticipating, what we had uh, been shown over the last couple months and then when you get a blowout headline number like this obviously a little bit noisy for the month of january given the seasonality factors there but certainly nearly double what the street was almost anticipating. Yeah, some of the sectors that saw the biggest job gains occurring in professional and business services, healthcare, retail trade, and social assistance. I mentioned healthcare before we even had started this, and we're going to get some more color on that as well going forward uh, from our reporting and our entire team covering this, but rose by 70,000. So you look at this average that continues to come forward, 58,000 per month in 2023. And now, of course, it's important to remember that this is a mid-month to mid-month type of reading. And so going forward from here, it'll be interesting to see where that also dovetails into some of the investment strategy that we've also heard. Important from to note, like, let's zoom out here. Bigger picture for investors, guys. Uh, the employment market from November now to January suggests that whole trade that worked so well last year uh, by the Magnificent Seven because we might get more rate cuts and everybody's buying AI chips. I think this really dent starts to dent then. I'm surprised to see NASDAQ futures hanging in there. And I get we had a blowout Amazon report. Apple was a little squishy. That was okay. But nonetheless, this really is flying the ointment to the bulls that really have bought a lot of stocks going into last year. And then I would argue uh, that pushed markets new highs earlier this year. This just blows up that trade, I think. Yeah, we're going to talk more later on about that squish mallow report for Apple here. Also, though, stocks, they are certainly kind of mixed here. Futures right now still pointing high for the NASDAQ as well as the S&P 500. Dow futures moving lower. Let's get on over to Yahoo Finance's Jared Blickery, who's got the breakdown here. Hey, Jared. This is a scary, hot report for the Fed, and we're seeing a downward reaction in the futures. I'm going to go to the Russell 2000 first because it was flatlining. Now it's down 1%. You take a look at the NASDAQ. It was uh, about one percentage point uh, higher, maybe 1.25%. You can see it's given up more than half of its gains there, and the Dow also sinking into red territory. It was hovering in the green just before the report. Uh, to Sazi's point, uh, a lot of times we do see the initial re reaction reversed, and so... 
don't take uh, don't take the preliminary reaction with too much weight here, but we will have to track this pretty closely throughout the day. Want to show the sector action? We had XLC, that's Communication Services. That is, guess what? A meta story that was up five six percent. That's only up three point eight six percent now. So those pre market gains have been paired. Um, also taking a look at consumer discretionary, that's up more than one percent. But utilities now down more than eight tenths of a percent. And let's get a read of what's going on in the bond market. We have two-year Treasury note futures. We can see they're down 30 basis points. Now, this is the bond itself, or bond futures. So we have to consider that the rate is going in the opposite direction. But fairly big move to the downside, and that means fairly big move to the upside in rates. Here's a 10-year T-note yield. Even bigger reaction to the downside, meaning yields up even more. Uh, scared, uh, whew, I, could, uh, I could impute a lot of things into the market right now. But actually, what I want to do is take a look at gold futures real quick. I saw those sell off initially. And they are at the lows of the session, down about 65 basis points, guys. All right, Jared, thanks so much. We're going to continue this conversation right now. For more on the jobs report, we turn to our panel. We've got Jennifer Lee, BMO, Senior Economist and Managing Director, and Drew Pettit, who is the City U.S. Equity Strategy Director here. Great to have you both here with us today. Jennifer, I want to begin with you. Just want to get your read on this red-hot report that just came in on the headline print. Well, good morning. Thank you very much for having me here. So my first uh, my first words were, oh, my God. Um, <laughs> like, I think everyone was shocked at this. Um, this whole soft landing, no landing narrative, I think, is going to take flight again. Um, and this is a classic case of how, you know, uh, the weird times that we're in where good news is bad and bad news will be considered good. Um, but, you know, I th think there's no no question. This is probably why, and I'm sure Fed Chair Powell, I don't know if he had any inkling about this, but uh, <laughs> I'm sure he's very glad that he dismissed that possibility of a March rate cut uh, because that's definitely not happening. Drew, how are you looking at this from a strategist perspective? Obviously, March even less likely than the chatter was ahead of this print, but pushing it out there to what we could even see, the odds that we would even have a rate cut here in the first half of the year. So apologies for coming off a little flat, but I, I'm not really a sports car driver. I'm more of a, I have two kids under two, closer to a minivan kind you, of Drew. guy at this point. <laughs> um, so honestly, this doesn't freak me out from an equity perspective. Um, you know, I, I do disagree that good news is actually bad news. I think that's been changing. I think if we had a print like this three, six months ago, we're probably looking at a much more negative equity market. Admittedly, like we're in the middle of earnings season. So there's a lot of micro influence on what's happening in the index action on the equity side right now. But if this feeds through to stronger fundamentals and growth that exceeds our expectations, honestly, I, I'm fine with the 10 year trading you know closer to 4% if the index d rates and earnings go higher that's how the market moves higher from here but maybe we just don't get that big bullish 5800 type move with rates higher but equity markets can still work in this environment. Drew, what do you think this says, though, with the narrative of a soft landing, the, the expectation that we could still avoid a recession if rates do stay higher for longer? Because even beyond this print, there were two revisions to the upside when you take a look at November's numbers and December's numbers. So I hate to kind of pivot away from soft versus no landing. I, I feel like it's a little bit of jargon at this point. At the end of the day, the inflation numbers coming down, but cost inflation numbers like we saw in average hourly earnings staying higher is just going to put pressure on productivity. So that's where we're focused. Forget about recession. It, it, again, if it's a mild recession, not going to freak us out. We think there's a lot of productivity gains companies can still make. And I think that's more of an important story, whether you know we get you know slightly negative real GDP growth this year and slightly higher rates than expected. As long as the long-term trajectory of rates is not up towards 5% again, I, I think we're okay on the fundamental side. Jennifer, from your perspective, as we're continuing to monitor wages and, and how that plays out and shows up in these reports as well, is, is that doing enough at least, or is that kind of el staying elevated enough to outpace where inflation is still extremely sticky, namely in housing, namely in some of the services as well? Well, I'm going to go to the, I've been saying this for some time now. I mean, it's always good news in my humble, humble opinion that we see strong earnings only because it, it's good fundamental support for the U.S. consumer and allows them to continue spending. And at the same time, as I always say, leave, uh, put some aside for a rainy day and that is never a bad thing. And this is, I think, 
the the key part here. Um, what I do, what I am concerned about on the wage front is that this will cause, as you're just pointing out, inflation to be stickier for longer. And my fear, I guess, is that the Fed will keep rates higher for longer, and that could have negative ramifications. Um, you know, so instead of rate cuts, you know, as, as the market was expecting in March, you know, we could get it, get it pushed out a little bit further. So we're still sticking with our second half of the year um, timing for rate cuts. But again, we continue to see numbers like this, you know, that's going to be on the table, I guess. Jennifer, what do you think the pace of the rate cuts could potentially look like after we do get that first cut between then and year end? What are you expecting in terms of uh, how quickly the Fed would potentially reduce rates? So again, before this morning's numbers, you know, we're looking for about 100 basis mm -hmm. points in total of rate cuts. So four cuts um, um, starting it in, again in the second half of the year, you know, pick it June or July, it, it doesn't matter. But again, roughly 100 basis points. And this is as, you know, they focus on the totality of the data as Fed Chair Powell um, opines all the time, you know, and if, as long as inflation continues to start coming down, and these numbers could get revised as well. But obviously, this is a very strong report still, and I am quite excited about it. And we also get, we by the way, we do get asked quite a bit about the soft landing, no landing story. So, and I think this bodes well with all that, and it shows that we, you know, that the U.S. is able to avoid a recession. Drew, this report drops an hour ahead of the opening bell here, and so now investors, traders, trying to figure out what is the first trade that they need to make if they are over positioned for a Fed cut that they anticipated perhaps would come in March or even in May. Look, admittedly, you're probably going to fade some gains at this point. Like we, we've run the index. The S&P is, is over 4,900 at this point. You know, we probably need to consolidate some gains. I think that's, you know, I, I think that's fair at this point. And I think this str strong print, maybe Fed moving out, you know, when cuts start. Uh, yeah, you can see a little bit of softness after a really, you know, strong overnight session. But Admittedly, I think if you trade this thing down five, six percent from here with all this economic strength, you should be a dip buyer. Jennifer, let's end here on uh, wage growth because that, that's a number, another very uh, hot number here within this report. Month over month basis is up six tenths of a percent, year over year basis up just about four and a half percent. In terms of that last mile for the Fed to get inflation back to two percent, when you take a look at prints that are much hotter or as hot as this, what does that then do in terms of delaying that potential timeline? Um. It's, it's very possible. Now, we can't always, we should never, ever be looking at just one single report, let alone one single number to decide about what the Fed's going to do, because it's, again, it's about the totality of the data. So we have to look at all the CPI reports and, of course, the core PC deflators and the super core, and to make sure that, you know, inflation is heading down in the right direction before we start seeing those cuts. But again, you know, as of now, we're still looking for roughly um, a, a, a rate cut to come probably in the middle of the year and probably still sticking with July. And uh, higher wages, putting more money in the pockets of consumers, which you know have been extremely resilient here over the last several months. All right, Jennifer Lee, always great to have you. And Drew Pettit, thanks so much for joining us here this morning. All right, we want to do a quick recap of the numbers. Again, headline number, 353,000 jobs added to the U.S. economy in the month of January. Taking a look, uh, unemployment rate holding steady at 3.7 percent. Average hourly earnings a month over month basis rising six tenths of a percent year over year basis rising four and a half percent labor force participation rate holding flat from the prior reading of 62 and a half percent. Keep right here on Yahoo Finance much more of the reaction that we're seeing to the jobs report when we come back.
Hot in here, January jobs report coming in hotter than expected. The U.S. economy adding 353,000 jobs versus the street's estimated 185,000. The unemployment rate stands at 3.7 percent and average hourly wages coming, coming in at 4.5 percent there. We've got team coverage to break down the key sectors in the jobs report with Yahoo Finance reporters Brooke De Palma, Alexandra Canal and Maddie Mills. Brooke, you're watching the hospitality sector. Let's go there first. Good morning, Brad. That's right. Joining you from the coffee bar out here. I mean, certainly employment showed little change in the leisure and hospitality industry this past month. Total jobs added within the leisure and hospitality group is up 11,000. But it's important to note here that total employment for the leisure and hospitality industry is still down roughly 160,000 jobs from pre-pandemic levels in February of 2020. Also, that 11,000 uptick is far lower than what we saw in January of 2023 when they were still bouncing back from the pandemic. Last January 2023, 90,000 jobs added. And in the month of December, a uh, 38,000. But restaurants and bars lost roughly 2,400 jobs last month. And in addition to that, hotels and lodging, well, they lost 31,000 jobs last month. And something that I'm really keeping a closer eye on is that average hourly earnings, that jump of 4.5%. We're seeing so many restaurants, franchisee operators across the country having to battle, understand, and implement those higher wages that went into effect across more than 30 states across the U.S. Also keeping a close eye for that California FAST Act. That's coming up rather quickly on April 1st in California. That has to increase the minimum wage above $21 in California. I know that Ali Canal is standing by in the newsroom with some retail sector numbers. Ali? Hey, Brooke, that's right. The retail sector is one of the top job gainers that BLS called out in its press release. So let's tick through some of those numbers. The BLS noting that retail trade employment increased by 45,000 in January, but has shown little net growth since early 2023. Now, over the month, general merchandise retailers added 24,000 jobs, while electronics and appliance retailers actually lost 3,000 jobs. We also saw average hourly earnings in the sector tick up slightly to $24 and 29 cents up from December's $24 and 27 cents but largely unchanged there and then on a year over year basis the unemployment rate for the wholesale and retail trade sector as a whole ticked down to 4.6 percent now that is down from the 5.1 percent seen in January 2023 now overall if we take a look at the past year so far it's been a bit of a mixed bag for retail Macy said it would be eliminating more than 2,000 store and corporate positions representing about 3.5 percent of its overall workforce and then just last week we heard from Levi's announcing plans to lay off up to 15 percent of its global workforce but at the same time we've seen big box retailers like Walmart announcing more jobs more stores really doubling down on its workforce at large on top of that we've really seen a resilient consumer strong spending strong confidence strong data there has been questions in the industry whether or not that could be sustained over time but clearly from these numbers that's not the case at this point if we do see job losses later on this year, perhaps that will indicate some cracks in the consumer. But right now, the data is strong. And speaking of strong, Maddie Mills has some more information on the healthcare sector at the New York Stock Exchange. Maddie? Yeah, Ali, nearly a fifth of the jobs added to this print came from the healthcare sector to the tune of 70,000 additional jobs. And this is really interesting because I was reading a note from Morgan Stanley's chief economist this morning saying that perhaps the boom that we've seen in AI could really stand to hit the healthcare sector in particular. We are definitely not seeing that in the data this morning. Just to run through some of the numbers again, healthcare, the second highest addition to this jobs print after business services. In January, employment in the healthcare sector rising, particularly in ambulatory health, by 33,000. Hospitals were up by 20,000. And nursing jobs and residential care, this is the space that we've seen the most growth in over the course of 2023, saw 17,000 additional jobs and job growth in healthcare, averaging about 58,000 per month in 2023. We know that we got the revisions to 2023 this morning. And earlier in the year, it looked like a lot of these sectors 
numbers were revised down. But we saw that hiring picking up towards the end of the year, especially in the healthcare space. So what that means, what is Jay Powell going to be thinking when he's reading this jobs report? I bet he's doing a heavy sigh this morning. President Biden probably very happy that he's got an event coming up later today after this stellar jobs print, hearing a lot of heavy sighs here at the stock exchange after that report came out better than expected. Yeah, Maddie, I was just about to ask about that. I mean, I doubt traders are throwing their breakfast on the floor and running calculus in real time, just trying to figure out what the next move from the Fed is going to be. But what is that feeling, that vibe on the floor as you're hearing from traders trying to think about just what this does mean for today's trading activity as well? Yeah, well, I was using one of my friend's terminals to uh, try and look at the jobs data as it was coming in. And they said, hold on, I'm getting a lot of messages from clients. I can't do this right now. Another trader walking across the floor behind me this morning saying, not good. And that is definitely going to be defining the vibe this morning. I want to quickly turn around to get a look at the boards because we saw the VIX tipping into the green. We saw the S&P futures dropping by about 19 points after this jobs data came out, obviously heavily in the green after those stellar big tech earnings last night. We're also seeing gains in treasury space, uh, particularly in the shorter term treasuries and in the dollar as well. All of that indicating a higher for longer Fed to come uh, and continuing to throw cold water on that idea of a March rate cut, which Powell already tried to throw cold water on earlier this week. This jobs report continuing to add to that idea. All right. Thanks so much, Maddie. And of course, our thanks to Brooke and Allie, giving us a better perspective of where exactly we are seeing some of that job growth here in the most recent reading for the month of January. All right. Well, again, the U.S. economy gaining 350,000 jobs in the month of January, blowing past the street's expectations. And the two prior readings on the jobs market both revised to the upside. Wage growth also coming in much hotter than what the street was forecasting. But there is one key number that could be viewed as a bit of a disappointment, and that's labor force participation. We want to bring in Greg Daco. He's EY's chief economist. Greg, it's great to have you here. So let's first focus on labor force participation participation because when you take a look at those headline numbers your immediate reaction will be hey this jobs market much much hotter than what we had initially anticipated does that labor force participation the fact that we didn't see a tick to the upside does that maybe pour a little bit of cold water on that initial reaction well i think we always have to be a little bit careful and look at all of the data not just the headline print in terms of payrolls payrolls were very strong but we knew there was going to be some seasonality effect i think that was part of the picture in terms of professional and business services it was also part of the picture at the state and local level um, but when you look at some of the other readings, the labor force participation rate was steady. We also saw a notable decline in hours worked, mm -hmm. and that brought hours worked back to their lowest since the pandemic. That is one area where we have to pay attention as well. And so as we think about where, and we just got the full sector breakdown, yeah. where people are still making their way back into the workforce, what is the most encouraging sector for us to continue to look at? Because there's some of the longer trends yes. that we'd seen in the leisure and hospitality recovery. There's some of the longer trends that we've been waiting for in healthcare as well. But if there's one sector that sticks out that we can perhaps hang our hat on and say, it's good that yeah. employers are making their way back in there. What is that? It's healthcare. Yeah. Healthcare has been the key sector that has been structurally deficient in terms of labor supply. That's one of the sectors that is still rising strongly. It has been the biggest contributor to job growth over the past six months, and that's very positive because we lost a lot of jobs during the COVID pandemic. We're getting these jobs back very gradually, but that is an area that is structurally restrained where you're seeing that progress be quite favorable. I would note one more thing that is important to consider when we're thinking about this labor market and what it means for the Fed. It is important to note that wage growth did accelerate, but it accelerated in the sectors where you saw the strongest job growth. Professional and business services, Part of that was seasonal, so I think that might be pulled back in February. And then healthcare, and healthcare is that structurally restrained sector. So it's pressure from one sector really that is outweighing the rest. The key question is, do we get more productivity growth? And that would bring about non-inflationary growth, which is what the Fed wants. So then maybe it, when you take a look at those very hot numbers when it comes to wages, maybe it won't be as problematic there than for the Fed, or really just in terms of that getting inflation back to that 2% narrative, what, what we have been talking about, the Fed's 2% target there. Maybe a print like this won't really complicate it to the degree that you would initially anticipate. Well, it does put the Fed in a mm -hmm. bit of a difficult place. But remember, the Fed framed its statement with a negative tone. That's very unusual for Fed policymakers to do that. We will not cut rates until 
we have greater confidence that inflation is sustainably at that 2% target or moving towards that 2% target. That's very different than a positive statement. So they have the optionality there to hold off for a longer period of time should the data necessitate a longer hold period. And then just lastly, while we have you here, you talk about productivity. A lot yeah. of people trying to figure out what generative AI is going to do for productivity <laughs> versus what humans are doing for productivity. How does that show up in the balance? Well, I think it's going to take a bit of time before we actually see it in the numbers. But Gen AI is one of those technologies that will affect us very rapidly. It's likely to be ubiquitous. We're doing a lot of research on the economic impact of Gen AI. We think that about two thirds of jobs in the US will likely be moderately to highly exposed. The third that remains, is not necessarily going to be immune from Gen AI, but will have some functions that are still exposed to AI. I think we have to keep in mind that Gen AI in lifting productivity will help on the supply side and also alleviate some inflationary pressures by augmenting our capability to do our work. All right, Greg Daco, always great to have you, especially on a day like today. Thanks yes. so much for joining us here Thank in the you. studio. All right, well, again, take a look here as we recap the numbers. A much hotter than expected print here for the month of January. 353,000 jobs added to the economy. Unemployment rate coming in at 3.7%, holding steady from the prior reading. Much more when we come back. It's 9 a.m. here in New York City. I'm Shauna Smith alongside Brad Smith. This is Yahoo Finance's flagship show, The Morning Brief, the ultimate guide to help investors make smarter decisions for their portfolio. We're tracking early session volume while bringing you today's top market themes while elevating Yahoo Finance's most popular newsletter. That's right. We've got a packed show for you here today. Futures mixed this morning after a smoking red hot jobs report. The S&P 500 and NASDAQ slightly higher. The Dow 
off more than 100 points now after getting another read on the labor market. The U.S. economy adding uh, 353,000 jobs in January, blowing past Wall Street expectations. Soaring past what the street have been looking for. And we also have earnings reports out from the tech giants. Amazon, Meta shares those moving to the upside, helping to couch some of the broader losses that you're seeing on your screen. Apple, on the other hand, lagging behind. Investors, though, Still a bit bullish on what they are hearing from at least two of the tech giants when it comes to app, when it comes to Amazon and Meta. So let's get right to it. Three things that you need to know your roadmap for the trading day. Yahoo Finance reporters Jared Blickery, Ines Frey, and Josh Schaefer have more. That's right. Tech investors cheering on Meta platforms and Amazon's gains this morning. The tech titans sparking more than a $270 billion stock surge collectively at the highs. Meta platforms beating the street's estimates on the top and bottom lines, posting its best quarterly sales growth in more than two years. The company also announcing its first ever dividend, 50 cents this quarter, and Meta boosting its stock buyback authorization by $50 billion. Amazon, for its part, is moving to the upside following strong growth sales and profit for the quarter and benefiting from the e-commerce giant's bullish AI investments. And another tech heavy hitter, we're watching Apple, the tech titan, seeing a rough ride this morning, announcing its first quarter earnings on Thursday, beating analyst expectations on the top and bottom line thanks to better than anticipated iPhone sales. Apple posting revenue of more than $119 billion, just up 2% from last year, reversing its downward string of four consecutive quarter revenue declines. Shares moving to the downside in pre-market trading as the iPhone maker deals with a sluggish Chinese economy and a resurgence in Huawei, hurting sales in the region. And the U.S. labor market starting 2024 on a high note. The U.S. economy creating 353,000 non-farm payroll jobs, well above the 185,000 expected by Wall Street in the month of January. Meanwhile, the unemployment rate held steady at 3.7% for the third straight month. This January jobs report offering new insights into the economy as the Fed considers when to start cutting interest rates. This comes just two days after Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell described the labor market as, quote, at or nearing normal, but not totally back to normal in his press conference on Wednesday. Amazon and Meta snapping big tech's earnings losing streak here. The companies both reporting huge profits and strong outlooks, sending their stocks soaring in pre-market trading. Joining us now, we've got Brad Erickson, RBC Capital Markets Internet Analyst. Brad, great to speak with you here this morning. You know, as you think about ultimately what this quarter has meant, and and perhaps we take a, a, a fine second here and look at Meta first. Let's start things off there because that is one area that if investors were looking at this company after a year of efficiency, it seems like they're now turning the dial in the opposite direction here. Yeah, absolutely. And nice to see you both. Thanks for having me. So um, last night was a quarter, the way we framed it was we may look back in a few years and remember this print as kind of a transformational moment. You're right. The ad business is firing on all cylinders. It looks like actually overall kind of digital ad demand is probably doing better than expected in Q1. So not necessarily just a meta thing. I think the bigger thing, though, that came out last night was, you know, Mark continues to Mark Zuckerberg continues to expand on their AI strategy and not interestingly for us, it wasn't just around kind of how AI will affect the ad business. He's expanding the scope of that. And and I think the thing we're kind of talking about in our in our comments post report this morning is that, you know, it almost feels like they're signaling an entry into the cloud business or some other type of service or capability beyond kind of the core ad business as we know it uh, today. Right, let's talk about one of the big announcements from this report, and that's a dividend. Talk to us just about the significance of this. And when it comes to investor expectations, shareholder expectations, what this also just tells us about Meta's financial stability at this point. Yeah, of course. I mean, gosh, what a what a difference a year or two makes, right? Um, I, th- I, I thought one of the things that investors really probably liked a lot on the conference call was Mark. Mark kind of, um, he, was, he was very... Uh, uh, he he almost kind of condemned himself for having not appreciated how well the company could run even as you became more efficient. And now you add on the dividend, which is really just it's kind of an olive branch, right? It's not a very big dividend at this point, but it's definitely a reflection of, hey, this company is 
growing and profitable for the for the future. And there's a lot of confidence there. And so there's, you know, obviously multiple angles of, of capital return now, which is which is really encouraging. So from that perspective and from that angle, then for investors out there that don't own Meta, that hear about this dividend now, does that make it not only more attractive, but does it make it a buy? Yeah, I mean, we we think this thing can go a lot higher. We've been I mean, last year in 2023, it was absolutely our top our top pick in mega cap and you know, kind of reiterated, it's it's a we're bullish on it in in twenty four as evidence. Um, the dividend certainly expands kind of the addressable uh, shareholder base that that could go out or would go out and and buy Meta. I think from here though, too, beyond just that the dividend as the driver, I think you know, back to my comments on potentially some type of an entry into the cloud uh, market that represents kind of unprecedented uh, multiple expansion opportunity. We know the earnings growth is going to be super strong for this company, but historically they've the multiples can been held back because emergence of things like TikTok highlighted that maybe the competitive moat wasn't like perfect on this business longer term. You start to talk about getting into other huge markets like cloud, that's multiple expansion potential on a whole other level from our perspective. Brad, the other big name that you cover here is Amazon. A strong report here from the company yep. after the bell yesterday. We're looking at gains ahead of the open, at least in the futures market, up just about 6%. What was your top takeaway from this report? And do you think it helps alleviate some of the fears that have been out there just in terms of where Amazon stands in this AI race with one of their big announcements? Yeah, totally. I think in Amazon's case, very good report also, stock up, like you said. Very different report, though, from Meta. Uh, in some ways, a lot more sort of linear, straightforward. And what I mean by that is investors really want two things out of this company, and we got both of them last night or the beginnings of them. One, they need to continue to, to see the operating income uh, results and, and outlook go higher. They did. That happened. And two, uh, investors looking for, for better confidence that AWS can, the cloud business can reaccelerate. And I think we came away from last night, investors came away last night feeling better about those two things. The, the, so the thesis, while it's kind of understood, our view going forward is, is that as investors continue to see kind of Amazon doing the blocking and tackling around those two things I mentioned, the stock can continue to work. And I think we're pretty convicted on that. Amazon was our favorite idea entering the year and certainly remains so. And so with that in mind, profitability, that's been one through line that we've been continuing to try and track across all of these companies over the earnings season. Uh, North America, particularly here, as they were kind of talking through the different regions here, uh, they mentioned operating margins at some of their recent low levels in Q1 of 2022. But now seven consecutive quarters of improvement, cumulative improvement of 800 basis points they're talking about over those seven quarters here. So how does that change perhaps the margin profile that investors should expect coming from Amazon? on going forward. Yeah, I mean it's 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 ramping margins, earnings and free cash flow on a scale that people have been wanting out of this company for 20 years since going public frankly. So that's why it's kind of so um so important. Uh just I mean just to give you a sense of the numbers. They just did 37 billion dollars in uh operating income uh in 2023. We have them forecast to do a hundred billion dollars of operating income in 2026, right? And when you're doing six, seven, maybe eight hundred billion dollars of revenue over the next few years, uh, you know, a hundred or two or three hundred basis points of margin expansion is obviously tens of billions of dollars of of that operating income. So, yeah, pretty historic kind of expansion in the earnings and free cash flow here. Brad, always a pleasure getting some of your analysis here, talking both Meta and Amazon for us this morning after both companies reported earnings yesterday evening. Brad Thanks Erickson, a lot. Good RBC Capital Markets Internet Analyst. Great to see you too. The January jobs report coming in red hot. The U.S. economy adding 353,000 jobs in the first month of the year, crushing the street's expectation for 185,000. Wage growth also beating expectations here. Here with more, we've got Yahoo Finance's Josh Schaefer. Hey, Josh. Hey, Brad. Yeah, so we're talking about obviously three pretty big beats there when you consider a lot of people have been expecting that unemployment rate to pick up for a while now, and it just really hasn't. We're sitting at a historically low level of 3.7%. Obviously a massive beat on job growth. But one thing I wanted to hone in on here, guys, is that wage growth number because we know 
over the past two years now, that's been a big thing to talk about in terms of what it means for inflation. Obviously, Fed Reserve, Federal Reserve Chair Jay Powell speaking the other day and saying that essentially they're not looking for more softening in the labor market. They feel pretty confident. He also mentioned that they were no longer worried about a wage growth spiral. He directly addressed that. And now we have wages growing at their fastest level since July 2023. It, it just... It, I don't know. It feels a little bit at opposition with what we heard the other day in some ways. Yeah, I was going to say, and also now you have to bring up the fact that maybe this would reignite some of the fears that we could see a bit of a move up here in terms of that overall inflation story, the narrative in terms of if this is a sort of larger trend, and like we just talked about with Jennifer Lee, you can't look at just one data point and put too much just your eggs in one basket here, but it does point to a potentially concerning trend here for the Fed. And then, of course, the question is how the Fed is going to potentially walk that fine line and balance what could be an upside here in inflationary pressures. No, it definitely is something to consider. And I think there's the other camp that would come at you and say, well, everything all, else points to the other. Oh yeah. All we know is inflation isn't falling and maybe we're not even in a soft landing. We're actually in a no landing scenario, mm -hmm. right? When you take a look at how hot this job market is right now, like I think we need to start also really using that word guys, hot. Mm -hmm. This is basically a hot job market again. We're, we've been using the phrase slowing. We've been using the phrase cooling for a while now. Over 300,000 job ads in back-to-back -back months. I, you can't underscore how big that is and what 4.5% wage growth is doing for consumers. You take a look at, obviously, it's very early in the first quarter, but even something like what the Atlanta Fed is tracking for growth in the first quarter right now came out at 4.2% yesterday. Mm -hmm. Like, well above 2%. We're, t we're talking growth here. Yeah. And I think we're seeing that in the early January data when people had started to, I think, after that Fed meeting, say, are we going to slow down a little bit? Are we going to be too restrictive? Not really, not really working thus far. In yeah. that sense. And then you also have to think about just the timing of any potential rate cut, how long that could potentially be punted for. I mean, mm. you take that into consideration, or I guess weigh that against the odds on the street. The street is still very optimistic that we are going to get some, a rate cut, if not at the March meeting. Yes, those odds have come down, but they're still optimistic we're going to get it before the end of the first half of the year. Well, because I think most people in their inflation forecast right now still see inflation coming down, right? Yeah. And I think back to the real Fed funds rate chart that we have in our chart book, the Yahoo Finance chart book online from Matt Lazzetti at Deutsche Bank, when you have inflation coming down and the, rate sta the interest rate stays at the same level, you're naturally getting more restrictive. And that is what a lot of economists that are calling for cuts right now are thinking about. They're not thinking because Jay Powell essentially told us on Wednesday, don't worry about the hot economy. We like the hot economy to some extent. Maybe he doesn't like it this hot. We're not sure. We'll find out as they speak over the next month. But he was telling us to really focus on inflation. And right now, what we know about inflation is it's coming down. So the Fed at some point would likely want to cut. All right, we will see what the timing all shakes out and what it ends up looking like. Josh, great stuff. Yeah. Thank you. All right, let's switch back to tech because the other big story in the markets this morning is some of the earnings results that we've gotten out over the last 24 hours. And take a look at Apple because a very different story when you compare it to what we're seeing from Meta and Amazon shares this morning. Apple shares off just about 3% after its sales jumped about 2% in the first quarter from last year. But the big story is the slowdown that we saw in China, the fact that that is overshadowing some stronger numbers that surprised us here from the tech giants. Let's break it all down. We want to bring in Martin Yang. He's Oppenheimer's Senior Analyst of Emerging Technologies and Services. It's great to have you here. So when you take into account that, hey, Apple's report was better on some metrics, yet China sales falling 13% in the quarter. What do you think that tells us then about Apple's challenges here over the next couple of quarters? Well, I think it speaks to Apple's exposure to more macro weakness than its competitive positioning in different geographic markets. Uh, we don't believe that the competitive uh, threat Apple is seeing in China is long lasting. I think it's a very near term effect based on uh, one or two single models from uh, either Huawei and Xiaomi. And we believe that most of the pressure is seen in China is more macro related than uh, competition. And so, Martin, as you kind of take a look at these results and try and figure out exactly where Apple can perhaps right some of the wrongs, segment by segment, I mean, there were a lot of misses on expectations here. And so even as I was looking at that last night, I said, wow, OK, it seems like this consumer right now is absolutely pushing back on price. That's absolutely carrying through to perhaps some of these cycles that Apple has seen in the past. What does this lead to in terms of some type of larger cycle adjustment, whether that be across services spending or whether that's across some of the other wearables as well? 
Mm -hmm. Sure. I think um, on the, the topic of price, uh, I would argue that Apple is the best value of products uh, among all smartphone OEMs. Um, it is true that it has a lot higher premium over uh, other products, but the lifetime value and the resale value is also a lot higher. So when you think about the cost of ownership and and the the, the savings you get from higher product durability and quality, uh, Apple is actually a better value product compared to other smartphone vendors. And also in, in key markets where the carriers are offering installment plans that certainly alleviate uh, the sticker shock for iPhones. And for other products, I think the most um, a critical driver is new product releases. We haven't seen a meaningful new release um, across um, uh, iPad and um, the AirPods in the past um, uh, six and nine to nine months. So once we see new uh, products coming uh, coming out, and then we'll see a revival a growth rate for the hardware accessories, a Mac and iPad. Martin, talking about what could come uh, down, come out down the uh, pipeline here, Tim Cook's comments on AI also grabbed my attention yesterday. He didn't give too much uh, information about it, but he said that we could have announcement or Apple could have announcement later this year. When you talk about the fact that they need products to excite the consumer, how big of a catalyst do you see potential AI integration for their products? Uh, it's, I think, one of the most important things for the success or the initial success of the uh, next generation iPhone. And uh, we will likely get a flavor of uh, how on device AI will perform and what are the new features it will enable uh, in, in uh, around June when Apple hosts uh, the WWDC 2024. And then, uh, you know, from based on what Samsung announced earlier this month, uh, earlier last month, I think, uh, you know, there are a very obvious uh, utilization of AI on device, um, you know, better pictures and, uh, you know, better uh, auto uh, translation and better uh, uh, writing. And then I think AI, uh, Apple will um, need some of the new features that are unexpected, but are highly, highly um, 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 convenient for uh, the, its users. What product do you believe is going to be able to, and, and we've been watching this iPad very closely here in this segment, it's expected that the, of course, vision could one day, one day perhaps make a huge dent or, or at least be additive. Um, but does it need to be the replacement for the iPad in the future in terms of another product that, I don't know if it sits in the wearables or whatnot, but it, it doesn't really matter. It's just as long as it is a positive revenue contributor for the company going forward. Can it actually kind of fill the gap where we're seeing some of those declines, at least in consumer demand uh, for a product like the iPad? Yeah, for iPad, I think um, there's uh, the uh, one of the most critical drivers for iPad is form factor changes. And we are seeing initial adoption of foldable displays or flexible displays on smartphones. So, you know, iPad will be the obvious choice to adopt that technology where you can, you know, turn a, a 13, even 14 inch iPad in the future, fold it up and then turn it into a, a very small book form factors and becomes even more portable than where iPad mini is today. I think that will be a very critical driver for the future of iPad growth. Martin Yang, who is the Oppenheimer Senior Analyst of Emerging Technologies and Services. Martin, thanks so much for taking the time here this morning to break down Apple. With thanks us. for having me. Certainly. Well, coming up, everyone, another Tesla recall. Shares of the EV maker falling this morning. We're going to give you all the details after the break.
Welcome back. Let's take a look at some trending tickers that we're watching this morning. Another setback for Tesla as they recall over 2 million electric vehicles in the U.S. over concerns around its warning lights. Now, this is the largest ever recall for the automaker here. You're taking a look at shares of about 2% on the day, uh, moving lower by about 2%, I should say, on the day. Uh, of course, not the first instance that we've seen within the past few months of recalls. The larger question, though, within each of those recalls is whether it is set up to be an over their air update, something as simple as that, or whether people, owners of these vehicles, actually have to bring them into a service facility as well, which is what investors continuously have to uh, really try to analyze anytime they do see one of these headlines. Yeah, the issue here, obviously, just the latest setback for Tesla. Tesla has really been caught up in a number of challenges here for the company in terms of recalls, in terms of hiccups there for Tesla over the last several months. So a headline like this and the scale of it, the fact that it is recalling more than 2 million vehicles, obviously that is grabbing investors' attention here this morning. But like you pointed out there, Brad, I think a lot of questions is just in terms of the complexity of this. Now, we want to make it clear that the issue here is that it's a critical safety information. It makes it hard to read critical safety information on one of the panels in their vehicles, which they're then saying increases the risk of a crash. That's why a Tesla is recalling this car. Owners are getting notified through the mail about this. So again, how quickly they are able to address this, that is really going to determine how big of a challenge this is for Tesla. Tesla is saying this is an over-the-air update, so that's mm -hmm. good to know. And then additionally here, we have a statement as well that the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration uh, is put out here, warning lights with a smaller font size can make critical safety information, as you were mentioning, on the instrumental uh, instrument panel difficult to read. So increasing the risk of a crash, we'll see and make sure uh, hopefully that everybody gets notified in time. Um, but again, uh, we'll see exactly how many of the shareholders that are out there continue to try and look at this and uh, ensure that, you know, uh, as Tesla continues to combat with what the NHTSA, NHTSA has looked at in the past, that they're able to continuously just give some of these over the air updates. Uh, it, could be good in some instances, yeah, I guess. Yeah, certainly, you know. and that's why we're not seeing a bigger reaction here in shares this morning. All right, let's take a look at Clorox because shares climbing to the upside. A bit of good news in today's market, up nearly 6% in the pre-market. The company boosting its profit forecast off of a rebound in inventory. Now, it's CFO saying that we've made a lot more progress more quickly than we anticipated. So to make it clear there, their inventory levels improving, and that, of course, viewed as good news here to investors, to the company as they try to clear some of that backlog, which has been a problem not only for Clorox, but many of the other names within that space. We know Clorox has had to raise prices there in order to offset some of the inflationary pressures that they have been facing in the past. The stock had been under pressure there. So a bit of good news here for investors, a reason why we're seeing the shares up just about 6%. Great news on the gross margin yeah. side for this company, too. Gross margin increased to 43.5% from 36.2% in the year-ago quarter. They mentioned benefits of pricing, cost savings initiatives, as well as uh, those more than offsetting some of the unfavorable foreign exchange rates that they're seeing right now, too. So uh, that particularly passing through to some of these earnings results that we had seen at the end of the day. And net sales up 16 percent in the quarter. And also weathering some of the uh, recent pressure that they've had because of the cyber attack, too. So moving yeah. past that, also the guidance coming in uh, a bit better than expected. They're raising their guidance for the second quarter. All right. Well, coming up next, we've got the opening bell on Wall Street. Again, you're looking at some pressure, at least for the Dow, following that much hotter than expected January job sprint. More on that when we come back.
Just about two minutes until the opening bell on Wall Street. Let's take a look at futures. They are mixed, but the Dow under pressure. Futures pointing to losses, at least at the open, as well as the S&P following that much hotter than expected January jobs number. Yahoo Finance's Madison Mills on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. Maddie, you've been talking to traders all morning. We were very surprised by that blowout print. What are you hearing? I think everyone was surprised, right? I'm hearing a lot of, oh God, this sucks on the floor this morning and a lot of movement in terms of the markets here. I was looking at the S&P 500 futures. They've dropped a little over 30 points just since that print came out. And that's after, of course, that amazing big tech news. That wasn't enough to keep the market from getting a little bit of an impact from that jobs print. I did just take a look at what the market's pricing in in terms of Fed cuts. They're pricing in about a 20% chance now of a March cut. Remember, previously we were talking about 50%, right? And now we're at a 58% chance of a cut coming up in May. So seeing the market repricing in the chances of these upcoming Fed moves when it comes to the benchmark rate. I also want to point out that this jobs number is obviously surprising in a lot of ways, but it's particularly surprising given that so many individuals were not able to work due to weather. This comes in spite of 588,000 individuals unable to work because of bad weather and because of the birth death rate as well over the past month. All right, you can hear it there on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. Despite some of the worry and concern out there in the markets, a lot of hype and a lot of excitement ahead of that opening bell as we kick off the final trading day of the week. Investors still digesting that hot print on the January jobs number that we got just about an hour ago. You're looking at Alto Neuroscience there celebrating their public debut by ringing the bell on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. And we've got team coverage for you of the biggest moves that we're seeing here this morning. Yahoo Finance's Madison Mills is still standing by for us on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. And Jared Blickery is also there at the Interactive, taking a look at the broader movement that we're seeing across the world. Now, Maddie, let me go back to you just in terms of some of the movement that we're seeing right here at the open. A lot of focus ahead of this number had been on some of those regional plays. Yeah, it's interesting to see kind of what the market is doing. I'm just taking a quick look, uh, seeing some negativity off of that jobs print. It's interesting, particularly because we had such a stellar day yesterday off of Meta, off of Apple. We're seeing the S&P up by, I think, about two tenths of a percent, the Nasdaq about channeling around three tenths of a percent this morning. The Dow, though, is in the red after that jobs print. So will Meta, will Amazon be enough to lift this market? I'm interested in how much uh, tension is on Meta versus Amazon. Everyone this morning was talking to me about it's all about Meta. Uh, but Amazon also had a good day, right? Also hearing people uh, joking about whether or not we're going to see a continued sell off in Apple saying never bet against Apple, right? So that's interesting to me, given that we've seen a lot of negativity around Apple, several downgrades on that name over the course of just this year. So interesting to see that there's still some bullishness, at least here at the stock exchange around that name. Having said that, though, I do want to focus on what's happening in the Treasury space because we're continuing to see movement there to the upside following that jobs report, but also following what happened with New York Bank this week, New York Community Bank Corp, rather. And it's interesting to continue to see that we might be getting some pressure in the region regional banks, what is that going to mean for the Federal Reserve, who took out their sentence about concerns over regionals and banking in this latest meeting? Now, that was before they knew about what was going on with New York Community Bank. But will that change their tone moving forward? And is this an idiosyncratic issue or reminiscent of a bigger problem of stress to come in the banking sector? That's something I'm going to be watching play out. It's the primary driver, my sources are telling me, of the Treasury space. So continuing to see what's happening there. It's really pulling down the KBW index. That's the banking sector. So we'll continue to watch how banking is able to stand up to some of those regional pressures. All right, Maddie, thanks so much for tracking all the activity on the floor at the opening cross here. And let's get on over to Yahoo Finance's Jared Blickery, who's here at the home base at the Wi-Fi Interactive. Jared, what are you seeing? 
Thank you, Brad. We're seeing some weakness in the small caps there, also in the Dow, and then a little bit of strength in the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ. Russell 2000 has had a tough time lately, uh, but when you take a look at the other markets, uh, kind of surprised that we saw an initial move down, uh, and maybe we shouldn't be surprised because a lot of times that initial move is just a fake out. Really doesn't matter until we get closer to the close today. That's going to be the arbiter of how this jobs report has been uh, taken by the crowd, uh, by the street. And here's the S&P 500. This week, uh, it was a tough Fed day that we had that loss in there, but then we had a nice bounce back yesterday, and here we are back in the green for the week. And I just wanted to bring one tweet to everyone's attention here. This deals with market concentration. How narrow can the rally be when more than two thirds of stocks in the S&P 500 have 50 day moving averages above their 200 day moving average? That's a technical uh, setup right there. By the way, that's the best level in more than two years, and it is still rising. That's what you need to know. So not seeing too much in the way of market concentration, which is a good thing. We want to see that rally broaden out. Now, XLC, that's communication services. That is a meta story. That was up 5 or 6% in the pre-market. So 2% gains are nice, uh, but not anything what it was before. And just quickly, energy and consumer discretionary also outperforming. Real estate taking on the chin there. As we see the 10-year yield rise considerably, utilities too, those are interest rate plays. And let's take a look at the NASDAQ 100. Check out Apple. Apple down 3%. Meta up 15%. Amazon 5.6%. And Alphabet down 2.8%. So lots to consider there. Before I leave, I want to uh, just throw one thing out there. I've been seeing a lot of chatter on, on Twitter about the MAG7 and should Tesla be included or should it not. I'm going to put a market cap on these mega caps here. I've included Eli Lilly, and you can see Lilly clearly greater than Tesla here, $630 billion. So I'm not the arbiter of this one. We'll have to see what the street thinks and what the crowd thinks. And we will. All right, Jared Blicker, thanks so much for an early look here at the movement at the open. Well, again, the broader indices mixed at least right now here at the open with the Dow off just about over 100 points. The January jobs report coming in much stronger than what the street had anticipated. That's why we're looking at the Dow under pressure. The Nasdaq, though, holding on to gains. A lot of that having to do with the strong numbers that we got out this morning from or last night from Amazon and Meta. Let's talk about this, how investors should be squaring the two. We want to bring in Sonia Meskin, BNY Mellon's investment management head of U.S. Macro. Sonia, it's great to have you so first that job sprint it took us by surprise it took many investors by surprise what do you think that means then for equity movement and some of the uh, volatility concerns creeping back into the market sure sure i think you know uh, of course the january number itself was very strong but the revisions were also strong and there's a lot of talk about the seasonality effects in the january number but then if you look at the three months average gains um up to January, um, those are quite a bit stronger. And then what would be consistent with uh, wage growth, uh, that itself would be consistent with 2% inflation over time. So we like to say that wage growth of over uh, roughly around 3.5% average hourly earnings is consistent with roughly 2% core PC inflation over time. And what we're seeing is 4.5%, both in the gains of average hourly earnings year over year, and also um, roughly backing out what we saw in headline gains again over the last three months in the NFB. So yeah, the you know the labor market is obviously strong. What does this mean for equities? Um, uh, on the one hand, of course, rate-wise, um, got to pair back expectations of uh, early cuts from the Federal Reserve. On the other hand, just as you mentioned, if growth overall holds up, which the consumer is a very big part of this economy, if the consumer is employed and relatively optimistic in terms of spending, then the prospects for the services sector, which is the biggest part of this economy, are also relatively sanguine. Um, of course, there's certain elements that are going to be suffering, such as the regional banks that you guys just discussed earlier. Whether this is systemic and it's going to spread to the rest of the economy, I think 2023 has proved that the economy is relatively resilient. You know, what's wild, Sonia, is that coming into this report, we were having week after week of conversation around the number of tech layoffs that were coming forward or layoffs that seemed like it was significant percentage cuts from household name companies and wondering if it was going to show up in a report like this, maybe not this report specifically, but whether it would change the narrative of the entire labor market. And it doesn't seem that that's the case at all. Well, we still have large sectors, healthcare, um, you know, large part of the professional services that continue to hire. 
Um, so while the layoffs can grab headlines, I think that it's the net, you know, the net that's really the most impactful for the consumer. Sonia, what is the, how are you looking at this from an investment standpoint in terms of the winners and losers that we could see play out in the market? Because yes, if you have a strong jobs, uh, if you have a strong job sector right now, obviously that could point to future gains here for many uh, in corporate America. So how are you then using a number like today and trying to identify potential winners off of that? Of course. Well, fundamentally, I think this number just tells us do not stay in cash. The story for 2023, I think, from a lot of strategies, a lot of shops was that, you know, cash is king. And what we're seeing is a continuation of the actual story that, you know, was going on on the ground is that, no, cash is not necessarily king. It's good to diversify. It's good to stay invested. Um, uh, equities, uh, especially, I think, stronger balance sheet companies um, offer good opportunities and fixed income continues to offer good opportunities. Because you can capture uh, price appreciation on the downside when the Fed does begin to cut, but you're also getting yield. And so for any investor, and we were talking about this a little bit earlier this morning as well, for investors that were trying to bank on uh, perhaps they were extremely bullish for a, a March rate cut or even a May rate cut, how does this change the calculus for their portfolio? I think, you know, folks that are not day traders, folks that are kind of more medium to long term looking, whether the Fed goes in March or goes in May or June, I don't know if that changes the story all that much, right? Maybe it changes how far down they're going to go. But at the same time, again, if we come back to the growth story, if the economy is strong enough and this level of rates, um, maybe with some adjustment, is roughly appropriate then it really shouldn't change the outlook for stronger companies, be it on the equity side or on the fixed income side. Sonia Meskin, who is the BNY Mellon Investment Management Head of U.S. Macro. Sonia, thanks for taking the time here this morning. Appreciate it. Coming up, Exxon and Chevron in focus on the back of their earnings results. We'll break them down on the other side of the short break.
All right, Exxon and Chevron reporting better than expected earnings for their most recent quarters as the two oil giants double down on fossil fuels. Well, those recent bets are paying off. When you take a look at those annual numbers, both companies reporting their second highest annual profits in a decade. We want to bring in Neil Dingman. He's a Truist Securities Managing Director of Energy Research. Neil, it's great to have you here. So your first take at these results that we're getting from both Chevron and Exxon and their ability to do this at a time that hasn't exactly been as bullish for crude prices as what we saw back in 2022. Yeah, thanks for having me, Sean. I think what it shows is their production is phenomenal for both, um, not only uh, in the Permian, let's just look at Exxon, for instance, that just reported or just had their call a minute ago. Permian production and Guiana production continues to set records quarter after quarter. So while some other EMPs are maintaining flat production, these con- these big companies continue to show that even with sort of flattish pricing, maybe a little bit lower pricing, they can continue to generate record production, which is generating record earnings or near record earnings and record cash flow resulting in just, to me, phenomenal uh, shareholder return. And so for shareholders right now that are trying to get their best read on the state of oil coming off of both the reports from Exxon as well as from Chevron, how would you kind of encapsulate that right now? It's a good question, Brad. I think what I would suggest is anybody holding it, you can expect, one, not only cash flow and earnings to likely go up about another 5% this year, but along with that, it's interesting. I mean, look, both these companies are paying out about a 4% dividend, which is, I think is, is is quite good. And on top of that, both are even buying back more shares on an absolute level than what they even pay out on dividends. So, you know, to me, the, the, the shareholder return is still the story. I don't know many other sectors where you can find companies this large and, and get this kind of shareholder return. Now, when we talk about the disruption in the Red Sea, the implications or the impact that that is having on some oil giants around the globe, what does it mean in particular here for Chevron and Exxon? Well, I think it, it, it's a good question. I think that's why you, the, both these companies continue to lean very heavily on the Permian. Yeah. I, I think they made the, 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 the decision a year, maybe even a couple years ago, to really focus. You have Exxon now that bought uh, Pioneer. Uh, that's going to close next quarter. Uh, even, I don't want to say double down, but it's going to add, you know, a tremendous amount of, of Permian production. So I think it's exactly what you're saying. I think there's going to continue to be uh, geopolitical risk international, and it's why these companies continue to focus predominantly on the lower 48 for growth. And so with that in mind, should we still continue to be concerned more geopolitically, not just about conflict that might break out, but also about production considerations as well and, and how that flows through to both of these companies. You know, it's interesting. I actually asked Darren Woods that this morning on, on, on the Q&A and, you know, his comment was or his answer was that he's going to continue to do what's best for the company. So, you know, while there might be some pushback if U.S. companies start to grow too much, uh, I think still most importantly is what these companies are able to throw off in cash flow and, you know, again, the best, biggest driver is going to continue to be the Permian and, and Guiana. And I think you're going to, conceive, could, going to continue to see both of those pushed higher. When it comes to the, lot, lots of questions just about what the price of crude is going to look like, I'm not asking you to forecast how high or maybe the pressure that we're going to see in crude. But in terms of the ability to navigate, when you, t- when you take a name like Chevron and stack it up against Exxon, who do you think is better positioned to weather some of those potential challenges here, at least in the short term? I think both the, I would call it short-term and long-term, I, I, I think Exxon and the simple reason is now by adding that that uh, Pioneer, I think they have the dominant U.S. position, not only uh, above Chevron, but above any other company out there. So I, I just think they're phenomenally positioned. Um, I don't see anybody else with a better asset position, better inventory depth, all those kind of things. So I just have more confidence that Exxon can continue to ramp their production uh, at this pace for a longer period, given the uh, quality of their inventory. Is there one company that is best positioned from your perspective to weather some of the political punching bag nature that may uh, assume itself as we get it towards the the general election and, and we hear talks of even more and and more discussion and debate around clean energy and where the shifts are actually being made, where companies are not doing their part. And and is there one that's actually kind of taken significant strides well enough in order to insulate themselves from that conversation? 
I mean, they're, they're, they're both doing it to some degree. It's a good question, Brad. And I, I, I think, though, like, for instance, this morning, uh, a lot of the call today on, on Exxon uh, was around carbon capture, was around their lithium <laughs> project that, you know, by 2027 will be enough lith produce enough lithium to support uh, one million electric vehicles. So, look, I think fossil fuels we know is going to continue to be the dominant driver for both these companies. So even all those things they're doing outside, I think they're still going to take some heat, uh, especially given the amount of growth that they're both showing on the fossil fuel side. Neil, great to have you on. And thanks for giving us some of the insights from the call this morning. Neil Dingman, who is the Truist Securities Managing Director of Energy Research. Appreciate it. Thank you. All your markets action straight ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. From its subscription concept to the rise of streaming, Netflix has built itself into a force in the entertainment industry. The company generated over $32 billion in revenue in 2023, including over 247 million subscribers worldwide. Beyond the Ticker takes a deep dive into the company's biggest moments. In 1997, Mark Randolph and Reed Hastings founded Netflix in Scotts Valley, California. Three years later, Netflix launched its monthly subscription concept. DVD rentals were mailed to customers, along with prepaid return envelopes. Later that year, Netflix was almost sold to Blockbuster for $50 million, but Blockbuster declined the offer. In 2002, Netflix launched its IPO, selling 5.5 million shares at $15 each. It brought in $82.5 million. Five years later, Netflix announced that it would debut streaming video while retaining its DVD rental service. Netflix stock fell to around $9 per share in November 2011 after the company revealed that it lost 800,000 subscribers in its third quarter. Two years later, Netflix released House of Cards, the beginning of Netflix's original programming. In 2015, Netflix shares surged to an all-time high, over $100 per share. That was growth of 574% over the prior five years. In 2017, a study by PwC showed that the Netflix subscriber base was now equal to the number of cable TV subscribers, 73% of all U.S. households. Four years later, Netflix launched its gaming platform, Netflix Games, available on Android with five games at launch. The company also announced plans to expand its gaming service to iOS. In 2023, Netflix announced the wind down of DVD.com with its last shipment on September 29th.
New York Community Bank Corp hit with a downgrade from Deutsche Bank. This comes after a disappointing earnings report, excuse me, from the regional bank. You're seeing shares higher, though, by about 1.2 percent here uh, on today's trading activity. Yeah, Brad, when you take a look at some of the uh, concern, at least, that has been uh, surrounding the regionals here, a lot of that has been the fact that the weakness in commercial real estate has been creeping back into the conversation, especially after a hot jobs print like we got out this morning, the Fed potentially further delaying any sort of talk of a rate cut, and then, of course, the pressure that that would potentially put on regional players like this. It is notable we are moving to the upside here today, but when you take a look at maybe a five-day chart, you will see that pressure that we saw in the stock over the last couple of days and that of course pointing back to so many concerns that we have seen surrounding the regional sector at large adding to some of those earlier losses concerns about the CRE exposure but also just the fact that it reignited a lot of the fears that we have talked about nearly a year ago going back to March when we saw the failure of a few regional banks that frenzied selling that occurred then there was some worry that maybe this was the start of something maybe not to that scale but just in, th in terms of the line of thinking here from some investors is being a little bit spooked by some of those macro trends. So we saw that reflected in the regional banking ETF that you're looking at here on your screen over this past week. But again, when at least when it comes to some of those individual plays, when it comes to New York uh, Community Bank Corp, at least for today, able to regain a little bit, or I guess sustain its footing, at least for today's trading day, up just about 1%. But look at that five-day chart. It certainly tells a very different story. Yeah, indeed. And it really kind of harkens back to what we were thinking and monitoring even last year. And it was one big word that we were all doing a command or a control F every time we got one of the regional bank uh, reports that came out, and it was deposits. And if you were looking at this most recent one as well, this most recent report from New York Community Bank, the total Total deposits for this most recent quarter ending December 31st, $81.4 billion. You compare that to $82.7 billion that they saw in September, and that's the September ending quarter. But then also here, year over year, still an improvement, but those d deposits, and they said that the linked quarter decrease was due to lower non-interest bearing deposits, partially offset by an increase in uh, CODs or CDs, excuse me, certificates of deposit as well. You know, when it comes to New York Community Bank Corp, much of the uh, 552 million of the provision for credit losses, which was put aside here in the most recent quarter, part of that being allocated to their exposure to commercial real estate in their portfolio. All right, keep it right here on Yahoo Finance, much more of the broader market action ahead. Plus, we got shares of Cigna, Charter Communications, and Bristol Myers Squibb on the move this morning. More on that in the Five and a half percent rise that we're seeing in Cigna when we come back.
Did somebody say Friday? Welcome back to Yahoo Finance Live. I'm Brad Smith alongside Shauna Smith. Happy Jobs Day to all who celebrate out there. This red hot print that we got. We're going to get back to that in a moment. We're about 30 minutes into the trading day. Let's take a look at how things are shaping up right now. Well, we mentioned and summoned the January jobs report into the chat. Take a look at stocks reacting after that report came in hotter than expected. U.S. economy adding 350,000 jobs, 353,000 to be exact there during the months. And that's double what was expected almost. Investors once again weighing the timing of the Fed's rate cuts. And we take a look at the fact that we are still in the green in the NASDAQ. A lot of that having to do with yeah. better than expected uh, tech reports that we got out after the bell last night. MetaShares up just about 20% today. Let's take a look at some of those other individual trending tickers. First up, Cigna. Shares rising this morning after boosting its 2024 profit forecast. Now the health insurer also beating fourth quarter profit estimates thanks to lower than expected medical costs and strong demand for its pharmacy benefit management unit again looking at gains of about five percent all right and also watching charter communications here they are plummeting after missing quarterly profit estimates and posting a surprise drop in broadband subscribers the company's ceo is saying that a lot of their challenges are driven more by persistent competition and Bristol Myers Squibb impressing investors with its fourth quarter results and strong outlook. The drug maker reporting revenue from its new product portfolio, get this, jumping 66%. And they expect sustained revenue growth at that level. That's pretty uh, astounding there. You're looking at gains, at least here in early trading, up just about a half of a percent. Well, Brinker International reporting earnings, and this week, the Chili's owner bringing the heat, raising its annual revenue and earnings guidance, but consumers are trading down from some menu options, impacting the company's bottom line. With us now, we've got Kevin Hockman, who is the Brinker International CEO, Yahoo Finance's executive editor, Brian Sazi, also joins for the conversation here. Kevin, great to have you back on our airwaves here. First and foremost, got to know, what are some of the biggest shifts that you're seeing in this consumer right now? Yeah, you know, we get mixed signals from the consumers. So we've got some guests that are continuing the exact same uh, behaviors and purchasing patterns and, you know, trading up to, you know, more premium margaritas, bigger uh, plates of food, uh, more premium types of items. And then we've got, you know, a guest that we're winning traffic with right now with our 1099 unbeatable values. So, uh, and those guests that come in, they don't have as much alcohol attachment, as much dessert attachment. So we're really seeing. You know, a lot of people talk about it as there's one consumer and they're either, you know, soft or they're on fire. And the reality is there's different consumers and some are uh, continuing to consume like we've seen in the last couple of years. And then, you know, some are looking for better value. And we're going to be there for both. You know, the guys that can win with the consumer are going to win uh, market share overall. And that's what we're doing right now. And Kevin, Brian here. Always uh, nice to see you. All right, let me, I'm going to ask you two questions. One, first is because the consumer is so, is still pressured, that, that coarse consumer of yours, is that why you're taking images of wings off the new menu. I mean, is that the psychology behind buying things on the menu? And secondarily, do you think you have to discount more to get them through the door? Yeah, you know, I, number one, whatever you end up picturing on the menu is what guests typically will purchase. And so that was an example where we thought we could get incremental trade up on wings in quesadilla by picturing them on the menu. Um, what ended up happening was they were trading down for more expensive entrees. And so you know, we quickly course corrected. The team did a great job of getting new menus out that don't uh, feature those. Now, we will use uh, leadership value to bring guests in. So what we've been doing is advertising our unbeatable 1099 meal, um, which is a burger fries. It's almost a half pound burger, uh, limited chips and salsa, limited drink. And you just can't beat that anywhere, even in fast food now where the combo meals are typically higher than that, and they don't come with all the other stuff that I just talked about. So, you know, that's clearly why we're growing traffic share uh, in the industry. It's clearly why our stock price has responded the way it has in the past week based on that traffic gains. And I continue, that will continue to win uh, just if the consumer continues to be really value sensitive, at least, you know, on that lower end. Last night, Kevin, I, uh, full disclosure, I went to a bar. I ordered a non-top shelf uh, whiskey, neat, nothing crazy. $21, and at least yeah. where I live uh, in Long Island, New York, that seems to be the new normal price for an entry-level whiskey and hard spirits. Do you have any line of sight into when alcohol prices might be coming down? Because I imagine that is impacting your consumer, and maybe they're not buying that whiskey or extra beer with the menu. Yeah, you know, we have what's called a barbell strategy, Brian, which means we offer entry level price points for those that don't want to pay $20 for a drink. So, you know, I, I hate to do this, but I'm going to do it. I got our $6 <laughs> Draw Eddie Margarita of the Month that just launched in February. Uh, that wasn't at my pub yesterday. I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> 
and you can have as many as you'd like, but make sure you take an Uber home. And uh, but so you can get that right, and that's our number one selling. You know, our margarita of the month at six dollars is always our number one selling drink from a unit standpoint. But then we have we've launched these ultra premium margaritas like the Casamigos margarita and the Termano Blanco skinny, and we now have doubled the business that we do of ten dollar margaritas and up. So when we are able to get you know profit and margins from high end margaritas, it allows us to stay on six dollars for that guest that is really price sensitive. Uh, for their margaritas and i think that plays into our hands right because we you know some guests come in and they want that premium stuff and then other guests want to come in and just want to have a great margarita with great alcohol and do it you know at a sub ten dollar and in this case a six dollar price point you gotta go to the, those restaurants i gotta, I, I, I gotta get back to chili's I gotta, i'm missing the, i'm missing something here <laughs> kevin let's talk about what is the big one of the big stories of the day and that's a hotter than expected job sprint when it comes to your business how are you navigating that tight labor market and are you able to find the workers that you need. Yeah, you know, things have certainly eased up. You know, we've been on a massive listening tour all across the country, um, talking to our field managers to understand what are the things that we can do to make their lives easier, both for their team members as well as to make the guests feel special. And we've just been eliminating a lot of stuff that's just not value added. Over 20% of our menu is gone in the last two years that I've been here. Um, that's allowed the cooks to be more focused on a few core items and doing them much better. We've simplified uh, the front of house procedures, and it, quite frankly, it's worked. You know, our hourly turnover is significantly down from when I started, and our managerial turnover is leading the industry right now. And um, uh, and that that is something to really be proud of because when you have stable uh, general managers and managers in your restaurants, it means everything else is going to be better. The food the food's going to be better, the experience is going to be better, and the hourly turnover is going to be better. And that's exactly what we've seen. And I think that's why. We've seen that operational performance that's driven the stock price. Kevin, you talked a little bit about where you're advertising, the success of your messaging as well. One of the huge things in companies like yourselves is looking across where within that marketing mix and that advertising mix, you're choosing to put campaigns into market. And we're seeing a, a large shift from the linear opportunities that Brinker has leaned into in the past into now some of these streaming opportunities to meet some of those uh, engaged audiences there. How have you kind of looked across that and tried to figure out where these new ad tiers prompt you to reallocate some of that spend from linear into some of the streaming options? Yeah, it's a great it's a great point, Brad. So uh, linear TV still will be a, a great way, especially live sports, to get immediate eyeballs and awareness for you know whatever we're offering. Um, but certainly, if we're not covering our digital channels, particularly streaming TV or CTV is what it's called. Um, that's critically important for younger customers that have cut the cord. Um, and the cool thing about that is it's much easier to see the efficacy of the advertising when it's linked to a computer. So, you know, we're building out our CRM program right now where we're gonna be tokenizing all of our guests so we can understand their behavior, not only 18 months past, but their behavior in, uh, in real time. And then we'll be, when we put ads out in the market, whether it's in you know, CTV or digital, or even, even linear TV, we'll be able to understand which guests that were lapsed came in, which guests came in more frequently and which guests it didn't work on so we can make improvements of advertising going forward. So, you know, that marketing mix changing is actually a huge advantage for companies that have set up to read that data uh, properly and take advantage of behavior data of our of our consumer set. I guess less of a question, more of a statement here, Kevin. You know, I can't wait to see some of the data response from the influence index that you get from the boys to men collaboration there. That's going to be particularly excited. You got my, you know, Philadelphia soul really lit up with that one. Yeah, we, well, we brought them back to, uh, or, we, or we brought back the baby back uh, ribs jingle. So, you know, I want my baby back, baby back. So we brought that back, <laughs> but we did it with someone who actually can sing boys to men. Um, and they, you know, over the years, they've been mistaken that they had done the jingle and they hadn't. And so that's what kind of the joke on the ad. They loved doing it. And then they created some more ads for us that we're going to be running around March Madness behind our three for me uh, value platform. So I can't wait to, for you to see the new ads, but the old ads have really, really worked that we're getting incredible, you know, millions and millions of people are engaging with these ads and they love the fact that the Baby Back Ribs a jingle is back and it's being sung by incredible, an incredible group, Boys to Men. Well, it's uh, not the end of the road yet for the Baby Back Ribs. Kevin, when are you, you going to cut the size of those uh, quesadillas? Because aren't people just eating those for dinner? <laughs> well, yeah, that's what we talked about. So, um, you know, we create incredible value all across our menu, not just for Three For Me. The quesadillas is a great example where you could make that a meal and you know, we're going to we're going to try to minimize the presence of that so that uh, it they is got not some of the used cheese. as an Something, Come on. I mean, they got a, it's an appetizer. I mean, it's not a, it's not a dinner. It's not a dinner. 
<laughs> you need to tell that to my guest. <laughs> Kevin, always a pleasure to catch up with you. Thanks so much for taking the time after the most recent earnings quarter here. Kevin Hockman, who is the Brinker International CEO, as well as Yahoo Finance's Executive Editor, Brian Sazi. Thanks. Hey, thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Absolutely. We've got all your markets action ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. The 2024 presidential race looks tight. Early polls showing we could see a rematch between President Joe Biden and former President Donald Trump. And with the U.S. election less than a year away, some investors fear the race could create more market instability. Here with a look at what this election means for investors is Jamal Chandler, who is the Tasty Live head of options strategy. Jamal, great to have you on here with us. So what is perhaps the, the largest or more outsized consideration that investors should be anticipating or at least trying to factor in as we get closer to the election? Well, uh, you mentioned the election. As an options trader, one of the things we always pay attention to is the volatility index. And we're seeing in the VIX that there's a chance there's going to be a potential uh, volatility around the election. Now, that's not a bad thing. All that just means is movement. As you can see here, what we what we look from this is this is every expiration of the VIX futures. And the VIX is the volatility index. And so when you look at October there, uh, the VIX is a 30-day forward-looking measure. So October VIX futures are forecasting that November, which is when the election will be, will be a little bit volatile. And what that means is just we're going to see some movement. So typically, you know, if you're expecting sort of about a 1% move in either direction in the S&P 500, right now this is forecasting near 2% moves in either direction, which 
again, it's not to, not crazy. I mean, we saw the same thing in, in 2020. And Jamal, for investors who are trying to figure it out, maybe on a sector by sector basis, is that something you're exploring rather than just an overall market view when it comes to some of the policy differences between the two presidents, like defense spending and some of their energy uh, initiatives as well? Oh, Shane, 100 percent. I mean, we're going to see sector dispersion for sure uh, if there's a change at the White House. That's exactly what we saw in 2020. Sector dispersion essentially means you're going to see, you know, comm services, for example, with concerns like Amazon, maybe because of policy changes, maybe something happens there, right? Or maybe something happens in real estate, which again, real estate really struggled this past month. So you're definitely going to see sector dispersion. And so you want to position yourself accordingly. And so what is that proper positioning, especially as you have so much uh, oversold positions right now, or excuse me, overbought positions within tech that we've continued to watch and monitor, and even in the course of this elections, or not elections, in the course of this earnings season here, conflating two of the uh, larger issues here that we're tracking on the day. As you think about this investor environment that's leaned so much into tech, where might that kind of trickled into their option strategy towards a larger event like an election later on this year? Oh, Brad, now you're getting me to predict a little bit, huh? I mean, it's a very good question because uh, we've seen a lot of movement. Uh, you talk about tech. Obviously, Meta's moving crazy today, and it's been a wild week there. I mean, that company's maturing. Look at those guys. They have a dividend now all of a sudden, right? Amazon making big moves today. And so the question is is good. Are we going to continue to see this outsized performance in tech? Um, I, I, I think personally... Yes, I think both, uh, you know, whether the current president and candidate and obviously uh, potential candidates are going to be looking at tech. It's been huge, just particularly over the last four years. Pandemic brought all of that forward. And I continue to think we're going to see uh, positive moves in that direction. But again, what do I know? I'm just an options trader. I, I, I trade both ways, right? I trade risk. <laughs> so um, I think it's one of those things you definitely want to pay attention to, how tech is going to change, what's going to happen with real estate. We've seen commercial real estate really struggle. Is that something that's going to come back? We've seen all all these things about office openings, or I should say uh, the lack of, of, of space uh, that has been used for, uh, for office space, particularly in big uh, metro areas. So that's something to, to watch as well. But uh, you definitely want to, you know, sort of figure out how you're positioned currently in your portfolio and take advantage of possible moves that we're going to see coming in the future. Jamal, I'm curious how you, how investors in, ter in terms of some of the activity that you've seen are moving in response to this I guess a delay that we are expecting now from the Fed in terms of any potential rate cut, especially after on the heels of this very hot print that we got out this morning. What's some of the activity that you've seen play out in terms of the options uh, market? So, uh, uh, Shana, in the Fed funds futures this morning, we had a big move there, big change. Everybody's been talking about the March rate cut, right? Basically, uh, Fed Powell, you know, uh, uh, Chair Fedman, uh, Fed Chair Powell this morning. Oh, I'm sorry, a couple of days ago, essentially said we're not going to have a March rate cut. And the jobs number basically supported that because of the high wages that we're seeing basically shows inflationary uh, numbers inside of that numbers, uh, the jobs data. So as a result, you can pretty much take the, the March rate cut off the table, which I kind of it felt for a while, and I know there's a chorus of, of a few of us, a small chorus of us, that didn't really think of March cut it made sense um, because it's just so soon after we were really dealing with raging inflation. And so uh, the Fed funds futures slash ZQ this morning really changed. March does not look like there's going to be a chance for a cut. May has really changed as well. That's the, the following meeting um, for the, the chance of a rate cut. So that's also really uh, big there. And then if you go further out in the curve, November is something to keep an eye on. The November Fed meeting is about uh, a day after we have the, the general election. So that's going to be a really volatile one as well. And uh, as far as general options, I mean, look, this week was, was phenomenal. I mean, expected moves is how options traders really judge every market. And the expected move for this week was about 60 points in the S&P 500. We had a 98-point range this week. So it's been a, a phenomenal week. Look, I, I don't know how uh, those Fed members are going to convene after the election. That's a uh, tough task for themselves, and uh, they've been doing a good job so far, I guess, here, trying to tamper inflation. Jamal Chandler, who is the Tasty, La Tasty Live head of option strategy. Jamal, great to see you here this morning. The U.S. labor market seeing a red-hot jobs report for the month of January. The economy adding 350,000 jobs, blowing past economists' expectations. We've got Julie Sue, acting labor secretary, joining us now for a closer look at the labor market here. What is the, the, the tenor like inside of the White House as you digest these numbers once again, Julie? 
That's right. So this month's report crushed expectations. 353,000 jobs created, uh, remaining low levels of unemployment. It's been under 4% now for two years straight. The jobs report says 3.7%. We continue to see labor force participation high, meaning that people are in the labor market and when they're looking for work, uh, they're finding work. The other thing to note is that the wage growth was also higher than expected. And it's 4.5% over the year. And so the wage growth is also consistently beating inflation. So all around a very, very strong report that demonstrates that President Biden's economic policies are working and we are ha we have a very strong uh, economy at the moment. Julie, I'm curious if we want to pick out one uh, number within this print that wasn't too impressive or maybe didn't surprise here to the upside, that would have been labor force participation. It remained flat on that month over month basis. Why do you think we've seen labor force participation stall at this level? So for prime age workers, the number ticked up a little bit, right? And I will tell you that, you know, I certainly see when I travel the country, I was in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, I was in Columbia, South Carolina, I've been in Las Vegas, Nevada, wherever I go, we, I see workers uh, looking for jobs, finding them, but more importantly, feeling a sense of security, you know, feeling like uh, now when they join an apprenticeship program, when they go to a job interview, they're getting a job that, you know, it's not only a job, it's a good job that's going to allow them to support themselves, uh, you know, support their families and get a little bit of what the president calls breathing room. This is the economy that we want to build. People who want to work can find work and they're good jobs. How do, how do you believe that prints like this also help with the White House and, and trying to get the messaging across to the American public as well? Because there, it seems to be this disconnection of everyone, certainly, and for right reasons, focusing on inflation that was a much larger issue um, and the Fed then enacting its own policy pathway. And then now looking at where we're talking about here this morning, uh, a soft landing versus perhaps even a no landing type of environment. How does that kind of trickle through to the messaging that the, the White House is looking to convey to the American people as well? Well, as the president says, we are all laser focused on bringing down prices. Obviously, that has a direct impact on American families. So do wages, right? The, 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 the cost of things is one part of the equation. The other is what people make and making sure they make enough for uh, not just the basics, but to be able to afford a life and, and uh, you know, enjoy, uh, enjoy the good things in life. Um, I, I think the other part of this is that consumer confidence, you know, surveys are turning on that too. I think the bigger piece is that you know, the American people want to know that when they drive on roads and bridges, they're safe. They want to know that when they turn on the faucet, they're going to get clean drinking water. They want to know when they sit down and power up their computers that they have high speed, reliable, affordable Internet. Those are all the priorities of this administration. And 2024 is going to be a big year as we continue to deliver on those things. And I think people will feel more of uh, of the investments that are being made in the investing in America agenda. Secretary, one uh, encouraging piece, uh, one of the encouraging uh, pieces of this print has been the fact that women continue to enter the workforce. And for the third month in a row, I believe we saw more women entering uh, the workforce than men. What do you attribute that to? And what kind of improvement do you expect, hopefully, to continue to see on that end as you look ahead to 2024? Yeah, thanks for that question. I've said women have really powered this economic recovery. And when we think about what happened to women in the workforce during the pandemic, right, it was devastating. We really saw the dangers of obviously not just the pandemic, but uh, you know, a society in which there wasn't reliable, affordable childcare, where there aren't uh, paid leave policies. Those are policies that the president has also called for. And I think uh, you know, we know that when if we invested in childcare and paid leave policies and the like, it could bring more women into the labor force even than we have now. And we're already at, you know, beyond pre-pandemic levels in terms of women's labor force participation rate. But it would bring maybe 5 million more women into the labor force, as one study shows. And that could drive as much as $775 billion a year in economic activity. So we women are coming back. Women are, you know, the, the hearts of their families. They're also now, you know, uh, um, making money to support their families. Uh, and at the same time, we have more work to do to support working women. Uh, Labor Secretary, when we think about 
the productivity that a lot of economists are also focused on here. Uh, there's been continued discussion both, both here on our air, but also within some of the notes that we're reading about that productivity and then the layering on as well of things like generative AI, advanced technologies. How are you tracking that figure to get a better read on where the output is increasing as a result of some of the technological investments that are being made here at the, at the countrywide level? Yeah, so you know the information sector is one in which we saw significant growth in this jobs report. Uh, we are very focused, you know, the president issued an executive order about AI to make sure that as we, you know, as more artificial intelligence gets developed, deployed and used, that it is both safe and secure. And we know that it can't be safe or secure unless it does right by workers. Uh, we've foreseen that, right, in, in negotiations at the bargaining table from Hollywood to healthcare workers thinking about what is the impact of uh, AI going to be in the workplace. What we know is that when workers have a seat at the table to um, design uh, uh, uh technology that's going to be beneficial to them, there is a way to harness the good things about technology while uh, really mitigating uh, the harms. Secretary, when it comes to the growth that we could be seeing over the next few months, from your position, what you have been hearing from so many Americans, from your uh, colleagues there, what do you think is the biggest challenge to that future job growth at this point? Well, we know from not just this jobs report, but what we've seen you know, over the last two years, last year, more jobs were created under President Biden than any single year in the prior administration. And this, today's report really does demonstrate that we are making significant progress, that a vision of an economy from the middle out and the bottom up, where we don't leave anyone behind, where we focus on working people and working families, uh, where we you know, are focused on job creation and investments in America, including jobs that don't require a four-year degree, and then we put in place training programs, apprenticeship programs, and other things to connect people who might have been left out to those jobs, that those things are working. So um, our, uh, you know, Bidenomics is going to be about continuing uh, what we've been doing, continue to build on that progress. Uh, you know, we do have more work to do, and we're going to stay at it. Secretary Sue, we really appreciate you taking the time. Thanks so much for joining us here this morning on Yahoo Finance. Thank you. We'll keep it right here. We got much more of your market action ahead. Again, the Dow off just about 95 points. We'll be right back.
China's demand for new housing might drop around 50 percent in the next decade. That's according to a new IMF report out today. It's setting the country's major markets lower once again. We have seen pressure on the Chinese markets now for quite some time. We want to head over to Ines Frey, standing by with a closer look at some of the movement to the downside that we've seen in us. Yeah, that's right, Shauna. And part of the reason behind the predicted fall in demand for housing is because of built up inventory and a decline in new urban households. China's population is shrinking and urbanization is slowing and that slowing demand will make it hard for new housing to be absorbed, leaving a large inventory of unfinished or vacant properties. Now, China's real estate sector grew quickly over the past couple of decades. And keep in mind that China's real estate sector had accounted for about 20 percent of economic activity. The country's housing sector sector became a way for people to speculate and invest their money because they didn't see other attractive places to store their wealth or save for retirement. But since the government took action to rein in high leverage developments during the pandemic, activity in the sector has really contracted sharply. Housing starts have fallen more than 60 percent relative to pre-pandemic levels. Sales have fallen amid concerns that developers will they simply lack funding and that prices will fall in the future. What does this all mean for China's economy? Well, the country's GDP grew by 5.2 last year, according to government figures. That's less than 5.4 percent growth that the IMF had anticipated. The international lender forecasts China's growth will slow to 4.6 percent this year as demand for housing falls, guys. All right, Inez, excellent breakdown there and uh, charting as well of the stats that we've gotten out of the region. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. We've got all your markets action straight ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
Sports betting companies are gearing up for Super Bowl 58 nearly just a week away, a little bit more. As football fans place their bets on the big game, the Legal Sports Report projects bettors to wager nearly $1.3 billion in legal U.S. markets. Joining us now to discuss the sports betting landscape is BTIG digital gaming analyst Clark Lampin. Clark, great to have you here with us. So let's run through the expectations here first and, and who, from a stock perspective, is perhaps set to get the biggest windfall here. Yeah, well, thanks for having me on the program this morning, Brian. I think the if we're thinking about windfalls and who benefits most from a big Super Bowl and an improving sports betting market in general, it's going to be the two largest U.S. operators, so DraftKings and Flutter, which is the parent company of the U.S. market leader, FanDuel. If we take a step back and think about how big the market is right now, both of the operators expect about 20 to 30 percent year-on-year growth. We just passed 10 billion dollars in overall gross gaming revenue last year, and from here forward, we see a very robust setup. Uh, about 50 percent of U.S. adults are now legally able to wager on sports. That rate of penetration is likely to go up. Uh, with gambling now becoming a more commonplace and socially acceptable entertainment outlet. So the setup looks good, not only into the Super Bowl and this year, but for many years to come beyond that. Yeah, Clark, it certainly is a favorable setup, or at least it seems like at this point. I'm curious, though, in this environment right now of sticky inflation, consumers coming under pressure as a result of that, how big of a headwind or challenge is that for the sector? You know, if you look back at data from Las Vegas uh, through the great financial crisis, it's surprising we actually didn't see that much variance in player wagering. So I think there's reason to believe, based on some of that historical data, that the activity is actually pretty sticky, surprisingly. And so with that in mind, now as we're thinking about some of the new entrants into the publicly traded landscape, Flutter the most recent, of course, there was a lot of fanfare. Mm -hmm. We all saw Wall Street, Gronk out there spiking the football. But as Shauna was mentioning, this consumer environment, vastly different. The customer acquisition costs that these companies also have to put out there, vastly different than a lot of the other, perhaps, casinos, the resorts that just welcome people into an experience. So how do they differentiate themselves on the digital side from a realm where the Super Bowl is very experience-driven for people who are making their way there, but for the rest of us, we just got to fire up an app, I guess. Yeah, the way you differentiate yourself in that sort of digital ecosystem is with the breadth and depth of your product. So how many different things on the Super Bowl are you going to be able to wager on with DraftKings or FanDuel relative to some of their competitors? Uh, some of the upstarts have had product that we believe has lagged some of the market leaders a little bit more. There are also scale advantages in this space, not only with product, but with um, the way you're able to fine tune pricing, manage your risk better than some of your peers, when you have a larger consumer base and more data signal, that tends to translate to not only a deep moat, but one that's also widening too. Clark, from an investor standpoint, when you take a look at the chart of DraftKings, for example, the one year chart up 140% over the past year. When you talk about that optimism or what we have to look forward to in terms of growing the market, how much of that, though, has already been priced into the stock? A good deal of it. And if you think about where DraftKings was in, in, in 2022, they were at a level where they had about 25% of the market. That's moved to about 35%. What we think is attractive about DraftKings and Flutter from here forward is that we're only about 50% covered in terms of uh, US adult population. That's gonna move to 80% over time. As that happens, you're gonna see upward pressure on the adoption rate, increases in spending, and because DraftKings and Flutter each have about 35, 40% of the market, a lot of the incremental value that gets created is gonna flow and accrue directly to them. Which team? That's the piece that we don't think is priced in right now. Okay. Clark, which team are the digital gaming analysts out on the street uh, lining up behind for this game? <laughs> you know, I'll leave it to the experts uh, or for you to opine on that, uh, Brian. But I, I would say it's, um, it's hard to bet against Pat Mahomes, especially as an underdog. I know. I'm going with the 49ers, though. I love the Brock Purdy story. We'll see how this all plays out. Clark, it's great to have you. Thanks so much for joining us here at Yahoo Finance. Thank you. All right, keep right here on Yahoo Finance. Much more of your market action ahead. We'll be right back. With the touch of your finger, 
that smartphone that can entertain and inform you can become a back alley where the lives of your children are damaged and destroyed. I was sexually exploited on Facebook. I was sexually exploited on Instagram. I was sexually exploited on X. This is my daughter, Olivia. This is our son, Matthew. Look at how beautiful Miriam is. My son, Riley, died from suicide after being sexually exploited on Facebook. Just like with all technology and tools, there are people who exploit and abuse our platforms for immoral and illegal purposes. It is time for a federal standard to criminalize the sharing of non-consensual intimate material. We share the committee's concern and commitment to protect young people online, and we welcome the opportunity to work with you on legislation to achieve this goal. Uh, Mr. Zuckerberg, you and the companies before us, I know you don't mean it to be so, but you have blood on your hands. You have a product. You have a product that's killing people. I just want to get this stuff done. I'm so tired of this. It's been 28 years, what, since the internet. We haven't passed any of these bills because everyone's double talk, double talk. It's time to actually pass them. And the reason they haven't passed is because of the power of your company. So let's be really, really clear about that. Our, our job is to make sure that we build tools to help keep people safe. Are you going to platform. compensate them? Senator, our job and what we take seriously is making sure that we build industry-leading tools to find harmful to content, make money. to take it off the services, uh, to make money. and to build tools that empower parents. So you didn't take any people. action. You didn't that's take any true, action. Senator. You didn't fire anybody. You haven't that's compensated a single not, victim. Let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. There's families of victims here today. Have you apologized to the victims? I, Would I, you like to do so now? Well, They're here. You're on national television. Would you like now to apologize to the victims who have been harmed by your product? Show them the pictures. Would you like to apologize for what you've done to these good people? Continue doing industry-leading efforts to, uh, to make sure that no one has to go through the types of things that your families have had to suffer. Uh, legislation's come out of committee before in, in unanimous uh, fashion. It just hasn't ever received a vote. And that's uh, something that um, the Senate leadership obviously has some control about, and, and likewise in the House. Um, so I don't know that there's certainty as to sort of where this goes, but. If there is going to be a place where Congress does de decide to pass legislation regulating social media, um, this would be it. Um, this is, you know, the closest thing to consensus among both parties, I think.
The jobs market remains red hot. Wages rising once again. The January jobs report showing that average pay is up 4.5% from a year ago. Yes, it's good news for working Americans, but at the same time, when inflation remains sticky, higher wages is putting even more pressure on employers, especially smaller businesses. Yahoo Finance's Brooke DePalma is out in the field at one business that certainly is feeling the impact of those higher wages. Brooke. Good morning, Shauna. That's right. I'm here with 16 Handle CEO Neil Hirschman. Uh, you kick things off with that higher wage growth. Growth. We saw four and a half percent jump last month. How are you accounting for these higher minimum wages? You have restaurants in New Jersey, Massachusetts, Texas, Florida, South Carolina. How are you thinking about these higher wage costs and recruiting talent? Yeah. Thanks so much for having me. And good morning. Um, so. Minimum wage went up about 7% in New York City, and you always hear that, that, new, uh, that restaurant and food operators don't have a huge margin, and so adding any cost by 7% is going to be difficult. Fortunately, we're in a very high margin, low labor business model here in the self-serve frozen yogurt um, and frozen dessert business. So, you know, we have a little bit more room for it, uh, which is great, but what's really important is to retain talent where we have it and focus on the people we want to focus on. And so we're definitely, uh, you know, increasing the wages for our managers and we've continued to do that we want to keep them for a long time and then we also see a net effective wage that's quite a bit higher close to that 1920 range when you uh, account for tips at the register so you know the pos sometimes asks you if you want to add a little bit uh and in the frozen yogurt world people are already happy so adding a few cents usually is okay yeah, I do want to talk about that self-serve operation model. I mean, certainly automation, a key part of that. Do you plan to add more automation to your future uh, restaurant plans given these higher minimum wages? Yeah, there's, there's definitely, definitely a balance, balance. right? Because we want that uh, community-driven personal aspect. We don't want to lose the personal touch by any means. And people come here for a good time, so we want to give them that same experience. That being said, we're already a very automated business. There's a lot of other concepts talking about different robots they can have. We've got a robot right behind you. The, the frozen yogurt machines are always mixing and freezing and, and making the perfect consistent product every single time. And then we do have that self-service business model, which does inspire customers to make their own creation and create one of a thousand different Sundays at any given time. That being said, it also does help on the labor cost. So we do need, of course, great uh, people in the stores and, and our team you know, across all of our stores is probably three to 400 people at any given time um, helping clean them, organize, keep everything stocked and, and on rotation. But overall, uh, things are okay. And right now you have roughly 30 locations. Like I said, you're rapidly expanding. You plan to double that footprint in the next year. How are you recruiting the right franchise operators? Build costs are up. There's uh, lots of other companies that are uh, weighing in on heavier incentives, whether it be marketing incentives or cost incentives. How are you recruiting new operators in these new areas? Sure. For us, the numbers really speak for themselves. We've got one of the highest, if not the highest, average unit volume in frozen dessert or in any dessert. Our top store just did $1.8 million last year, which is a lot of cups of uh, frozen yogurt. And so, <laughs> Lots you know, of we, too. yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, so we look at that, um, and that's really a, a helpful selling point. But then also a, a, a lower cost to build and manufacturing all the millwork in bulk. So we remove some of those build costs from the local operator. And so it makes it an easier turnkey experience for our franchisees. And they want to be part of the next growing brand. And, and we really do feel like 16 Handles has that market position right now. How many franchise operators are, are coming in this year? Uh, so we're looking to open about 20 stores this year, six in Texas uh, this spring alone, a bunch in Florida, South Carolina, in Boston, uh, probably in April, some more in New Jersey and New York where you know, we really have that stronghold. And you don't see any of our competitors out here because they just wouldn't survive. And I know that you guys can't smell on the screen, but it smells so good in here. There's lots of sweets, lots of fruit. I mean, commodity inflation has been something that we've been hitting on for the past year. Cocoa futures right now absolutely soaring. How are you combating commodity inflation right now? Yeah, so for us, uh, dairy, sugar are really the, the commodities we focus on. And we do hedge and, and, and kind of buy our sugar, sometimes very early, sometimes very last minute, to make sure that we're able to keep stable prices because we need our cost of goods to be reasonable for, for our operators to have a really high profit margin. And so we are co uh, always kind of evaluating that. It has been difficult. What's great is the dairy prices have started to stabilize recently. Um, and you know diesel prices are also have been a big concern over the last two years and, and made it really difficult for operators. And you see trucking companies going out. There's less competition in the market. But we have 
been able to, to make it work and, and kind of maneuver our way around these obstacles. I do quickly want to hit on the state of the consumer. You've seen this, the price of your cup rise about 3 to $4 over the past few years. Who's coming into your stores, and are they pulling back, back a bit on just so many topics? Are they not adding the fudge anymore? Uh, what is the state of your consumer right now? Uh, it's, it's slightly the opposite. We see traffic counts up at all of our stores, so people are coming more to our brand. You have to remember, a lot of competition did close. A lot of uh, shops that you know, had an okay concept, just didn't survive through the pandemic, unfortunately. But that has opened the market for, for concepts like ours to be a little bit more successful. And in addition, consumers understand the cost of everything has gone up. It's not that we're raising our prices because we want to. It's, it's literally to have good, fresh ingredients cost more today than it did three, four years ago. And so we're giving that experience to the consumer. Um, that being said, we are really careful with our price increases. Minimum wage has gone up. We have not raised our prices here in New York City. Um, we've kept them flat because we want our, our customers to feel like they're getting a great experience, a great value every time they come in. 16 Handle CEO, Neil Hirschman. Thank you so much. I cannot wait to grab a sweet treat. Back to you, Brad, in the studio. If you don't bring more, Brooke, you're going to have a lot of upset people here. That's for sure. <laughs> Brooke De Palma for that interview. Thank you so much. Well, switching gears here, Disney's proxy battle with activist investor Nelson Peltz heating up. Peltz now revealing two current board members that he's seeking to replace as investors gear up for the media giant's annual shareholder meeting. That's coming April 3rd. Let's get to Yahoo Finance's Alexandra Canal, who's been tracking all of this. Yeah, uh, I mean, my goodness, this, this has been unfolding in front mm -hmm. of our eyes, Allie. Yeah, lots of developments in this proxy battle. Now, try and find they launched a definitive proxy uh, statement. They, they released that on Thursday, once again encouraging shareholders to nominate Nelson Peltz and former Disney CFO Jay Rasulo to the company's board. And as you alluded to within that statement, Peltz also named two current board members that he wants to see get the boot. Those two members are MasterCard executive Michael Foreman, along with Mel Lagamassino. Now, Mel has been an executive of companies from Coca-Cola to JP Morgan, but Peltz arguing that both of those current board members do not possess the necessary skills to take Disney to the next level, considering all the issues that the company faces today. He also called out Laga Messino for heading up the compensation committee that's doled out over $800 million in payouts to executives while the stock price has suffered. And we know that's been a big sticking point for Nelson Peltz. Now, separately, he also sent a letter to shareholders, once again, criticizing Disney's direct-to-consumer strategy, along with its theme parks and lack of creative efforts, especially at the box office. He said Tryon would initiate a board-led review of Disney's creative processes and come up with more aligned plans when it comes to direct-to-consumer executive pay and succession. Now, all this comes as Blackwell's Capital also launched a separate proxy fight. So come that shareholder meeting April 3rd, Disney shareholders will be faced with three separate nominations. Now, Disney's has, you know, came out with a statement yesterday saying we only support and endorse our board picks, but guys, this is shaping up like a little reality show, <laughs> board battle. It's going to be some drama April 3rd. I'm excited. There's been a heck of a lot of drama ever <laughs> since Iger, really even before. I guess once Iger left the first time around, there has been a lot of drama surrounding Disney. And there's also some drama, I think, surrounding some subscribers, too, because one of the priorities that, like you just laid out from Peltz is he wants Disney to cut some of the losses that they have seen in the streaming business. We, all, we also just got some news out here yesterday about Hulu now cracking down on password checks. Yeah, so Disney updating those subscriber agreements for Hulu, which Bob Iger did hint at earlier this summer. He said sometime in 2024, the password sharing crackdown is coming for our streaming services. So the changes are going to go into effect on March 14th. So if you are sharing a Hulu account, expect to be hit with that password crackdown. Expect to possibly, probably pay up for your own subscription service. Now, Bob Iger has said that the password sharers were, quote, significant. Wow. So <laughs> this is something that, you know, he's taken a playbook out from Netflix. Yeah. We see Netflix be pretty successful with this rollout. It's another revenue initiative. I think it's going to come for all the streaming services at one point or another, but Hulu, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's probably a pretty <laughs> solid bet there, given the fact, like you just said, how successful it has mm -hmm. been or worked out in Netflix's favor in terms of revenue-wise. All right, Ali, thank you. Thank you. Let's take one more look at the markets here. 90 minutes into the trading day, still looking at a mixed picture. Stronger than expected tech results here from Amazon and Meta, helping the NASDAQ 
back up just about 1%, yet the Dow still in negative territory. A lot of that tied to that hotter than expected job sprint and what that means for Fed rate cut timing, the potential delay there that is putting pressure on the Dow. Yeah, the CME Fed watch probability of the FOMC leaving rates unchanged. It actually jumped by 23% following the report into the no change category here. So we're going to be watching that closely. That's all for us today. Stay tuned. We've got much more at the top of the 11 a.m. hour. Welcome to Yahoo Finance Live. It's 11 a.m. on the East Coast, 8 a.m. on the West. I'm Rochelle Akufa alongside Akiko Fujita. Here's a look at what we're watching this morning. The U.S. economy adding 353,000 non-farm non payroll jobs, well above the 185,000 expected by Wall Street. Meanwhile, the unemployment rate holding steady at 3.7% for the third straight month. Investors cheering on Meta and Amazon following their upbeat quarterly results. Both shares, they are hitting 52-week highs today. But Apple shares lagging behind as sales out of China come in lower than expected. Meanwhile, Intel shares under pressure after reportedly delaying its construction timeline for a chip plant in Ohio. We'll dig into the latest state of the chip market coming up this hour. First, though, let's do a check on this Friday of all three majors. We are 90 minutes into the trading day. A bit of a split picture here. The Nasdaq leading the gains, and we're going to get to why in just a bit with those strong results coming up from Meta as well as Amazon. The Dow trading pretty flat right now. The S&P 500 up about 31 points. Of course, investors still digesting that stronger than expected jobs report really a blowout one when you think about where the expectations were. Let's take a look at where Treasury yields have been because we have seen a big jump across the yield curve here. The five-year yield at 399 and take a look at the 10-year and 30-year yield well above that 4% level right now, Rochelle. 
That's right. Well, as you mentioned there, jo January jobs data coming in hotter than expected today. 353,000 jobs added in the month, nearly double what the street had estimated. And of course, wages jumping, giving the Fed even more breathing room to hold rates steady. Let's dig into how investors can use labor dynamics to inform their portfolio. Jose Rasco, HSBC Global Private Banking and Wealth Chief Investment Officer, is here to break this down. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. So as we can see here, this you have this hot jobs number here. Gives the Fed some breathing room when it comes to rate cuts. But what are some of the other pressures then as you look within the labor dynamics that investors should be aware of? Well, I mean, you want to keep an eye on wages. And, and the bad news is wages did tick up in this monthly report. But the really good news is that if you look, they have been decelerating for quite a few months now. Remember, this is a January report heavily affected by seasonal factors, not just in terms of employment, but in terms of wages. We saw the average, uh, average hourly earnings tick up a little bit. And minimum wage was raised in 22 states yet again this year, third year in a row that more than 20 states raised their minimum wage. I would expect that to, to even out as we go through the balance of the spring. But uh, for now, we saw a bit of a jump in wages as well. So what does that mean, Jose, when you're looking at your portfolio? Obviously, the question is going to be, you know, what does this mean for the Fed? The answer would be it's not just one data point. And yet we're coming off of a meeting and press conference from the Fed chair where he really tempered expectations for anything come March. Well, well, if you look at the consumer sentiment data, the consumers are feeling much more comfortable, much happier, and their expectations for inflation are lower, right? Which are, these are all very positive signs. But in terms of figuring out where the Fed is going to go, how they're going to pivot, and when they're going to begin to cut rates. We still think they're going to move in the second quarter and cut rates three times this year and then do the same thing next year, cut rates another uh, 75 basis points next year. So uh, we're thinking the Fed's going to move, but not quite as aggressively as the market. So Jose, as we look at the consumer and we think about things like inflation pressure that comes from that, if, if wages are, are, are creeping up and people are feeling better about the economy, want to spend, not seeing that employment number ticking down, though, what does that mean for that distance between where we are now and the 2% inflation target for the Fed? Well, if you look at the core PCE deflator, which is what the Fed looks at, for the last three months, and a half percent. If you look at the last six months, it's rising at 1.9%. So the core PCE deflator, which is said they've said is one of their measures, right? The PCE deflator and the core, we're already below their 2% target. And remember, the 2% target historically has been a symmetric target. It doesn't mean they want to go to that data point and stay there. They want to you know, vary around that data point, uh, some sort of average as they go forward. And we think we're very much on our way there. So that's the good news. Uh, and it's important to remember, you know, when people talk about the markets and what does this mean for our asset allocation, we think we're going to see volatility here in the short term, political reasons, geopolitical. We have a it's an election year, presidential election year, and a whole host of other factors like earnings that have to be recalibrated given fourth quarter numbers. Uh, but the bottom line is think back to 94, 95, right? In 94, 95, the Fed took Fed funds from three to six very quickly, and then they began to cut very quickly as well. And uh, we went through the rest of that business cycle with Fed funds at about five to five and a half. Uh, and the economy zoomed and the markets did very well. And technology in particular, which is one of the sectors we happen to like, did very well also. So is that where you're increasing your exposure right now? Well, what we did was we, we're we looking at uh, high quality companies. We want to be careful with, with small cap and mid cap at this point in the cycle because we do see some risks in terms of uh, some areas of the financial sector, right? Uh, but bottom line is we think that tech should do well, comm services should do well. The consumer, the consumer will probably trade down a little bit this year in terms of quality. But remember, real disposable incomes are strong and uh, employment gains, obviously, as we saw this morning, look pretty good. Uh, unemployment rate is barely budging. Uh, so we think the consumer looks relatively healthy uh, and inflation is down from 9% to 3.4, right? So I think we've got some good indicators for the consumer and those are some of the sectors we're focused on in addition to industrials. Now remember this American, this renaissance in manufacturing here in the US, manufacturing employment boomed in January, right? And we continue to see major inflow of capital and technology and we're gonna continue to see, remember construction, of manufacturing facilities in this country is rising at more than 70% year over year, seven zero. That's monstrous. 
So then, Jose, for people who had done, done a little bit of profit-taking with the tech rally then, where should they be positioning themselves? You mentioned some of the sectors, some of them a little bit more beaten up as well. Is now the time to get in, or, or should people wait, given the volatility ahead? Well, look, there's definitely going to be volatility. But I think if you look from the broader asset allocation perspective, we like alternatives. We like things that are uncorrelated to the equity markets uh, directly. We also like fixed income. We saw the peak in policy rates in July, we believe. Our economists nail that call. And um, we think market rates will go down uh, with inflation and with somewhat slower economic growth. We think the peak in growth was the third quarter of last year. Um, but we'll still see good growth this year. And therefore, if we avoid recession, inflation stays low and stable, and the Fed begins to cut rates, which we think they will. Remember, the federal about a third of the federal deficit has to be reissued this year, repapered this year. And we have commercial real estate, where about a trillion and a half uh, dollars of debt in the next two years is going to have to be tackled. So all those issues together suggest the Fed should ease, which makes fixed income very attractive from our perspective, extend duration, capture those longer rates. And in terms of the equity markets, broaden your, diversif broaden your diversification into other sectors like industrials, like the consumer, um, and even comm services we think is going to do well. And look at financials. Financials from when the Fed pauses over the next 12 months and when they begin to lower rates, financials historically have been a good performing sector, one of the top three sectors going back to 1982 in the S&P 500, right? So those are the top quality banks. A lot to process there in anticipation of a rate cutting cycle. Jose Rasco, HSBC Global Private Banking and Wealth Chief Investment Officer. Good to talk to you today. Appreciate the time. Thank you. Well, shares of Meta and Amazon are extending gains today, hitting new highs in this session as investors cheer on their latest quarterly results. The strength in the fourth quarter, driven largely by a rebound in digital ad sales, Amazon saw a 27 jump percent jump year on year, while Meta more than tripled overall sales from the same period last year, with a big chunk of that coming through from ads. Joining us now is Mark Schmulek, Bernstein Internet Research Analysts, uh, Mark, you know, so much of this is about setting expectations. Certainly investors liked what they saw yesterday after the bell. How do you sort of put these names that we've seen this week side by side to see why these particular names are being rewarded in such a big way today? Yeah, look, it's uh, you, you've certainly seen divergence uh, this quarter, uh, you know, starting with Meta well at the top, Amazon certainly up quite a bit. Uh, you know, Google was down by a similar amount that Amazon was up and, and of course, some of the others. And I think the biggest reason for that is kind of going into this year after the big year the Magnificent Seven have had last year, um, you know, there wasn't a lot of like really great conviction about really good ideas of what do you own in internet and tech. And I think those companies that put up the numbers where it mattered most and kind of calmed the biggest fears or worries about specific names uh, performed the best. You know, Meta, the biggest question heading in to 2024 was, you know, do you really want to own Meta into a decelerating revenue growth environment? Can we really trust them to keep their costs in check? And then they put out a monster guidance to suggest that the question we should be asking is how long can they keep this up? You know, and with Amazon, there was certainly a lot of excitement and a lot of optimism that, you know, 2024 was going to be the year they're going to finally deliver that operating income inflection, you know, we've long held out hope for. And, and that's exactly what they did. They put out a very, very strong beat on operating income for the fourth quarter, you know, their comments suggested that that, you know, operating income growth is durable, uh, you know, and it's showing up in the guidance for Q1. And, and this is exactly what investors want to see right now. And Mark, you called Meta, especially for that quarter, the Patek Philippe of Internet. Now, that's that's a pretty big statement to make, given especially when you think about the price and the significance of Patek Philippe and their watches. Talk about what you're looking at there that sets Meta apart and what is going to keep them having that edge. As you mentioned, if, it, if they're going to be on top, what's going to keep them there? Yes, uh, it's a watch fiction. I'm still not wearing any watches. But, uh, <laughs> um, you know, I think, you know, what stood out why I called it the, the Patek Philippe is really a couple of reasons, right? The, the famous Patek kind of slogan is you never really own one. You just hang on to it for a generation. You know, and, and the biggest complaint about longer term investors with Facebook and now Meta has been, you know, there's always this view that there's an expiration date, um, you know, to social media. 
And I think the, the more important thing I took away from this earnings was not the revenue beat and, and kind of guidance for 2024. That's great. You do need a strong core. But what they really showed is the longevity of this business, this vision, you know, that Mark has that we've all, you know, we've all questioned at some points in the past. Um, you know, the, the adjacencies are there. Threads, you know, usage is up. Uh, you know, Reels usage is, is up. Um, you know, WhatsApp is growing in the United States. You know, we've got north of 3 billion users and Facebook Blue is still growing in the U.S. You know, th this isn't going anywhere. And longer term, all the investments in AI and the metaverse, whether you believe in it or not, there's a pathway that, you know, this company's going to find a way to be around forever. And, and so just like Patek, you know, my, my, my comment here is you can own Meta stock and you can hand it down to your kids. Uh, Mark, there's certainly been a lot of questions about the impact AI, generative AI, is likely to have on ads. Um, you look at somebody like Meta, obviously Mark Zuckerberg talked about AI as a whole being really a, a, a huge booster because it allows them to target their users a little more. Um, when it comes to Google, though, Alphabet, how do you read the impact right now? I mean, some would argue that there could, you know, Gen, Gen AI is likely to, to, to be a headwind for them on search and that some of that was starting to be reflected in this most recent quarter. Yeah, it, it's interesting, right? Because if you look at you know where Google beat and surprised, you know, their cloud business, you know, surprise, it's, it's kind of turned around kind of the deceleration we saw last quarter, you know, the, the pathways there for margin expansion, which is certainly something, you know, investors have wanted to see from from kind of Google, um, you know, but the big debate is search numbers were, were really just in line. And I tend to think that's pretty good. Um, you know, but when the biggest debate is, is Google actually an AI winner or a loser? You know, and if they're winning it in the cloud business, but losing it in search where there's more entrance competition, you know, we've certainly heard of ChatGPT, Perplexity and, and others, you know, kind of saying, look, if, you know, if generative AI changes the game for how we behave, uh, you know, online, you know, does that put that mode into question? And, you know, unless they're going to put up significant beats on, on search revenue growth, uh, you know, this year, that question's not going to go away, which makes it a little bit more difficult to, to kind of own in size and get excited about owning Google here as, as a stock relative to somebody like Meta, who doesn't seem to have any real generative AI risk. If anything, you know, it's certainly something Mark called out on the earnings call yesterday, um, you know, that you can now get a Meta powered AI assistant that's going to be embedded in their smart classes, embedded into their suite of applications, you know, improving advertisers ability to target and, and deliver generative AI, you know, driven ads. You could see a lot of the upside potential there, whereas for Google, you know, you're talking about a potential risk, whether it's real or not, it's still very much to be determined, but, but to their cash cow. So then, Mark, we've been talking a lot about the weight of expectations. Obviously, if you're, if you're an NVIDIA, if you're, if you're a Google, but what about Amazon? How do they fit into that spot in terms of how they're being valued, given that they have very slightly different tentacles from some of these other counterparts, but a lot of overlap as well when it comes to AI and cloud? No, oh, of course. And, you know, you certainly have some, you know, AI questions with Amazon. Are they a winner or loser in the cloud business? And, you know, if you would have told me six, nine months ago that, you know, we'd be sitting here having a great quarter or very clean quarter for Amazon where they're putting up, let's call it only 13% growth in their <coughs> AWS cloud business. And, you know, we, we, we may have had some questions, but the reality with Amazon is, you know, this is a company that historically, you know, trades on operating income and free cash flow beats and, and, and raises. And, you know, this is a company that investors want to see them pull dollars down to the bottom line, not go on another very expensive reinvestment cycle. Um, you know, and that's those are the numbers where where they beat. So back to Google, the number they didn't beat was search, you know, and ad revenues. The number where Amazon beat was the one that people cared about most, which was operating income and free cash flow. And, you know, when you're putting up 29 billion in free cash flow in a quarter, um, you know, that, that's a lot to get excited about as an investor. And, and, and again, their comments that they're not just going to suddenly put that aside and go reinvest in, you know, the next big bet initiative that, you know, there's still a lot more juice to squeeze from this, uh, you know, profitability and, and free cash flow lever uh, makes it something that investors can get their heads around. And when you start looking out at 2025 and 2026 earnings and free cash flow multiples, you know, which is something we haven't been able to say, you know, a lot of in the past few years, you could talk your you could talk yourself into a pretty reasonable valuation to want to own Amazon here and a pathway to north of two hundred dollars for the stock. Certainly, investors agreeing with you there, given where the move is today. Mark Schmalek, Bernstein Internet Research Analyst. It's good to talk to you today. Appreciate the time. Likewise, thank you for having me.
It is time now for our trending ticker. And today we're taking a look at Decker shares moving higher up. 14.5% roughly. This comes after the UG maker raised its 2024 outlook in its latest earnings report out today. The company also saw record profit and revenue in the third quarter. And a big announcement coming through here, Rochelle, with uh, Dave Powers, the CEO of Decker's Brands, uh, saying that he will be retiring come August. Somebody who's been in places started as the president of direct-to-consumer back in August of 2012. They've got a succession plan in place, but certainly somebody who's been seen as a real architect of this turnaround. I mean, certainly going out on a high note, as we look at uh, some of the analyst expectations here for price target, Truist Securities, Joseph Civello, looking at a price target, moving his price target to $983 a share from $859. As you can see, the stock currently priced at $883. So still seeing a lot of upside here. And for people who aren't familiar with the brand who makes Hoka and Uggs, Hoka more so focusing on the running shoe. And then, of course, Uggs, you know, for, for your more comfortable person, that's me. I'm very much a, a big fan of the, of the Ugg line here. But it really does speak to what consumers are willing to spend on, because some of these do have a higher price point. But I think they've managed to build a loyal fan base here and able to turn things around, Akiko. Yeah, maybe some of that discretionary spending going in that direction. Not quite luxury. You, you point that out. Mm. It, it's a higher price point, but maybe priced right given where consumers are today in terms of what they're willing to shell out. It's true. Discerning indeed. Well, do stay with us. We have all your markets action still ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
taking a look at Intel shares moving to the downside this morning. The world's biggest semiconductor chip maker announcing delays to its $20 billion chip manufacturing project in Ohio amid ongoing weakness in the semiconductor market, first reported by the, world's, the Wall Street Journal. Yahoo Finance's Dan Howley has more on this story. Hey, Dan, so, so walk us through this and the decision to, to delay. Yeah, uh, Rochelle, this seems to be uh, an issue with uh, overall funding as well as the kind of weight that we're seeing for the Biden administration to roll out the, the funds for that CHIPS Act. Now, uh, Intel, obviously, uh, among the rest of the PC market, PC uh, ecosystem market that suffered from the slowdown in PC sales uh, shortly after the uh, pandemic boom that we had seen. So many people went out bought devices, companies went out, bought devices, and then, well, they didn't need them for a little bit. Uh, there's hope now that the, that's starting to turn around going into 2024 as, as uh, more people start to look for replacements for those devices, but that had an impact on, on Intel, obviously. And so uh, they're starting to see uh, a, uh, a slowdown in when they expect this facility to be completed. It originally was supposed to be up and running uh, by next year, 2025, but it looks like, uh, according to this report, it'll be 2026. And then after that, they still have to get the uh, high-tech equipment that's used to create chips up and running. And so that's going to take quite a while. Getting chips off the line is a, a week's-long process. So it's not as though, you know, you are making, you know, snack food or something. It, it takes a while to do this. Uh, and it also comes off news that uh, Taiwan Semiconductor uh, is having delays with its own plant uh, in Arizona. Both of these companies are more or less just waiting for the Biden administration to say, here's your money from the CHIPS Act. Uh, and that hasn't happened yet. Uh, the, the hope is, is that it'll happen uh, sometime in this year. Uh, sooner rather than later would be better. But this is a cornerstone of the, the Biden administration's push in technology. Uh, and if it can't get these two big factories up and running, then that push to get more PC or, excuse, excuse me, CPUs, uh, GPUs, AI chips built in the U.S. Uh, may start to fall flat. Dan Halley, breaking that latest decision down for us. Thanks so much. Well, that reported delay in Intel's Ohio factory, as Dan mentioned, just the latest setback for the U.S. as the country looks to bring chip manufacturing back home with billions of dollars set aside in the CHIPS Act. And that push to expand the number of foundries in the U.S. comes as American chip makers look to ramp up development of the most advanced AI chips. Let's bring in Christopher Miller, author of The Chip War, The Fight for the World's Most Critical Technology. Um, Chris, it's good to talk to you today. You certainly laid this out thoroughly in your book. How do you look at this latest delay? How significant a setback? And what does this ultimately mean in terms of the complexity of the very issue this administration is trying to address? Well, I think this delay, as well as the delays that we've heard from TSMC in Arizona, are actually not really about government policy. They're more about the market conditions that each of these two companies are facing. Uh, and in the case of uh, Arizona with TSMC, some construction delays uh, that they've had. You know, the reality is that companies know, uh, as it's been reported publicly, that the CHIPS Act money is going to be announced fairly soon, potentially in the next couple of weeks, according to some uh, media reports. And so I don't think it's really the case that uh, the, 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 the government money is the primary factor behind these delays. The, the key issue, I think, uh, for Intel is that, as was noted, they've had some softness in the PC market and also in the data center market. The shift has been away from CPUs, which are Intel's uh, historic area of focus, towards GPUs, which are used for training AI systems. And that's where NVIDIA uh, is uh, the primary player. Uh, so let's sort of break down where that is moving right now. Advanced chips, as you point out, GPUs, certainly in big demand. A lot of reason why we talk about NVIDIA a lot. Increasingly, we have seen companies that are developing generative AI, whether it's Google slash Alphabet, Amazon announced they're developing their own chips as well. When you look at the overall landscape, how much of that you think is, is actually going to be manufactured in the U.S., given the timeline? Um, and what does it ultimately mean for the U.S. to try and wrestle supremacy in manufacturing chips back here? Well, today, basically, all GPUs are manufactured in Taiwan, with a couple of small uh, exceptions. I think 
Taiwan is still likely to remain the most important manufacturer of GPUs for some time to come. But there are real signs that the U.S. will be uh, building some GPUs in the future. The other headline for today that's relevant is that uh, memory chip maker SK Hynix, which is a leader in a production of memory chips that are also relevant for AI called High Bandwidth Memory, HBM, is going to set up a facility in Indiana for producing the the memory that's necessary for AI and for GPUs. And I think that's a sign that this company believes there will be more demand and more production of AI chips in the United States going forward. And Christopher, what would that timeline look like? As you mentioned, given the dominance for the expertise and the equipment that really is based uh, in Taiwan, what sort of timeline could we be looking at, especially when you consider that with the Chips Act money? When do we actually see the rubber hit the road here? Well, we've already seen a major increase in investment in chip manufacturing in the United States driven by the CHIPS Act. And these plants are complex. They take two, three, four years to construct from the earliest stages until they're finally in high value manufacturing. And so it's going to be 2025, 2026 before a lot of these plants fully uh, come online. It's not something that can happen overnight. And Christopher, well, so much of the market focus has been on um, those chip makers who are developing GPUs. Uh, You've put out this interesting op-ed in the Financial Times this week warning about a potential slump in uh, specifically in foundational chips, as you describe it, because of what's happening over in China. Can you lay that out for us? Why we'd like to likely to see a, a significant dip in that because of the oversupply? Who's likely to get affected most? Well, today, China is devoting more subsidies than the rest of the world combined to try to build out its own chip industry. And because China doesn't have the most advanced technology or the most advanced manufacturing capabilities, much of its investment is going to more basic chips, the types of chips that are in household goods, in automobiles, in manufacturing equipment. And these are spheres where China's probably got the technology it needs to compete. And it's got huge volumes of government subsidies, substantially more than the CHIPS Act in the United States, uh, going into helping build out uh, new factories. And so this new supply, when it begins hitting international markets over the next couple of years is hard to imagine it won't have an effect on prices. And I think if you listen to trade officials in the United States and Japan or in Europe, they're really worried that China subsidies will begin distorting prices and impacting Western firms. And so then let's break that down a bit, because in terms of how some of these countries can plan for this or some of these companies that rely on these chips, if you're looking at low end chips that we tend to see in in common devices, say in your everyday phones versus the ones that are going to be powering uh, self-driving cars. What should companies and countries be doing then outside of ending up in a trade standoff? Well, I think a trade standoff, to be honest, is probably where we're likely to uh, end up. If you look at the the volume of subsidies going into China is something that just simply can't be matched outside of China. The US, Europe, Japan, they're not going to spend as much money as China is. And I think the choice that they face when it comes to certain categories of foundational chips is whether to let Chinese firms uh, win market share or uh, whether to respond with trade restrictions that limit Chinese firms' uh, market access. And if you listen to policymakers in uh, all of the Western countries that I mentioned, they're all increasingly talking about uh, examining trade restrictions, examining tariffs, examining other tools to limit the ability of subsidized Chinese producers of foundational chips to sell in Western markets. Finally, Christopher, the Biden administration has made a real concerted effort here to try and restrict the advancement or slow the advancement of advanced chip making over in China. Um, There's a lot made about uh, Huawei's recent phone that, uh, that the chips are a little more advanced, although not quite as advanced as what the U.S. is making. In your research, What is your assessment of where China is in this ability to compete with the U.S. on the most advanced chips? Well, if you look at manufacturing capability, China's most advanced chip manufacturer is about five years behind the world's leader in Taiwan, which manufactures most chips for leading U.S. firms like NVIDIA or AMD. And China's been about five years behind for the last 15 years. Every year, China improves a bit. 
but every year Taiwan improves too. And so the gap has remained more or less constant for some time. And I think that's likely to persist. China is going to try really hard to catch up, but catching up is very, very difficult, especially given that now China doesn't have access to some of the tools that are needed for cutting edge production. And so we, we shouldn't assume that it's just a matter of money and time to catch up. Uh, it's just a very, very difficult sphere to reach uh, cutting edge capabilities. Certainly a lot to navigate. I'm sure a lot of chip producers watching all of this very closely, of course. Appreciate you joining us, Christopher Miller, author of The Chip War for the fight, the fight for the world's most critical technology. Appreciate you taking the time this morning. All right, coming up, we're taking a look at the economy of remote work. Is it an upside of the US economy? We'll dig in after this break. Well, average hourly earnings saw a significant uptick in January in this latest jobs report, rising 0.6 percent from the previous month. Our next guest, though, says 40 percent of U.S. business executives are offering remote work options as a way to moderate wage pressures. Let's bring in Stephen Davis, Stanford Institute for Economic Policy Research Senior Fellow, to discuss more. It's great to have you on today. Uh, you certainly look at this from a very interesting perspective. Um, this comes as we have seen more and more companies UPS, the very latest this week, requiring employees to return to the office five days a week. Does that suggest that those wage pressures will ramp up even more? You know, I don't think so. Um, I think we're probably more likely just to return to a normal relationship between labor market tightness and wage pressure. 
Um, we've benefited, um, we as an economy and employers have benefited in the past two or three years because the expansion of remote work, the ability to hire, hire labor in lower cost living areas, for example, has helped employers moderate wage growth pressures. That's made it easier for the Fed to uh, bring inflation down. That process is still ongoing, but I think it's largely played out. And something that we continue to see, uh, women leading the January jobs gains uh, with 198,000 increase in employment versus 155,000 for men. And looking at the, the data from the St. Louis Fed, steadily seeing more women participating in the labor force post-pandemic. How much of that can we attribute to some of the remote and hybrid work options? And what does that mean for the Fed and their decisions when you do have more women entering the workforce? Yeah, it's a really interesting point, a big issue. I don't think we know an exact answer to that question yet, but we do know uh, from many studies that women have a disproportionate share of the caregiving responsibilities in the household. And that includes both childcare, but also you know, care of aging parents and, 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 and the like. And it's a lot easier to do that when you can sometimes work from home. So that's probably part of the reason why we see in survey evidence that women tend to value uh, the opportunity to work from home a bit more than men, but also people with young children, both men and women, they value the opportunity to work from home more highly. And it has to do with these greater caregiving responsibilities. And I think you're right. Some people are on the margin, disproportionately women who say, if I can work from home two or three days a week, well, then maybe I'll take that job. Whereas if I have to go into the office five days a week, you know, I'm just not going to do it. So, Stephen, uh, taking a step back here, I mean, where are we in this discussion about remote slash hybrid work? I mean, you talk to companies all the time. What are they telling you about where the assessment is right now? Is it pretty much where it's going to stay or are we going to see more and more companies call for employees to come back because they just think that's more productive? Well, we've been seeing calls to come back over and over again for a couple of years now, and, and usually they don't play out with big force. If you just look at the survey data uh, that I do with my colleagues or uh, from the Census Bureau, or if you look at Castle Security data, you know, office swipes, people moving into the office, all of those sources suggest we've sort of stabilized in the past 12 to 18 months, uh, not, not a lot of change. And we've also surveyed business executives and asked them, well, what do you expect to happen over the next five years? And they see if anything, uh, mild further increases in the extent of work from home. So I think we've more or less settled into a new normal. Uh, that doesn't mean that individual employers are still not struggling with, in some cases, trying to bring their workers back. In other cases, agreeing that we're going to work in a hybrid mode, at least for many employees. But then how do we make that work effectively for our organization? That's where we think, uh, that's where I think we are. So, Stephen, then for companies who signed, you know, obviously very long leases, commercial real estate, who obviously didn't see the pandemic coming and are trying to get workers to come back to, to justify some of the math, what happens to the commercial real estate sector, especially when you focus on offices, if this is going to be our new normal? Well, if you, if you look at the commercial real estate in major urban centers, um, it's in really bad shape. Uh, and that is indeed a delayed reaction to the pandemic and the effects of the pandemic on the big shift to work, work from home. It's been delayed for a pretty obvious re set of reasons. One is employers took a while to um, figure out where they wanted to be with respect to their remote work options. Uh, and of course, most commercial leases are long-term. So they, they may be five, 10 years. And so they roll off slowly, but the roll off's happening now. And, and uh, you can see uh, in, in many, many respects, uh, this very serious downturn in the commercial real estate market. And I think it'll be somewhat depressed for a few years in, in core urban centers with lots of office buildings. <clears throat> I'll continue to track that. Appreciate you joining us this morning. Stephen Davis, Stanford Institute for Economic Policy Research Senior Fellow. Thank you so much. All right, coming up, all your markets action just ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. With the touch of your finger, that smartphone that can entertain and inform you can become a back alley where the lives of your children are damaged and destroyed. I was sexually exploited on Facebook. 
I was sexually exploited on Instagram. I was sexually exploited on X. This is my daughter, Olivia. This is our son, Matthew. Look at how beautiful Miriam is. My son, Riley, died from suicide after being sexually exploited on Facebook. Just like with all technology and tools, there are people who exploit and abuse our platforms for immoral and illegal purposes. It is time for a federal standard to criminalize the sharing of non-consensual intimate material. We share the committee's concern and commitment to protect young people online, and we welcome the opportunity to work with you on legislation to achieve this goal. Uh, Mr. Zuckerberg, you and the companies before us, I know you don't mean to it to be so, but you have blood on your hands. You have a product. You have a product that's killing people. I just want to get this stuff done. I'm so tired of this. It's been 28 years, what, since the internet? We haven't passed any of these bills because everyone's double talk, double talk. It's time to actually pass them. And the reason they haven't passed is because of the power of your company. So let's be really, really clear about that. Our, our job is to make sure that we build tools to help keep people safe. Are you going to compensate them? Senator, our job and what we take seriously is making sure that we build industry leading tools to find harmful to content, make money, take it off the services uh, to make money and to build tools that empower parents. So you didn't take any people. action. But you didn't take any true, action. Senator. You didn't fire anybody. You haven't that's compensated a single not, victim. Let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. There's families of victims here today. Have you apologized to the victims? I've, Would I'm, you like to do so now? Well, they're here. You're on national television. Would you like now to apologize to the victims who have been harmed by your product? Show them the pictures. Would you like to apologize for what you've done to these good people? Continue doing industry-leading efforts to, uh, to make sure that no one has to go through the types of things that your families have had to suffer. Uh, legislation's come out of committee before in, in unanimous uh, fashion. It just hasn't ever received a vote. And that's uh, something that um, the Senate leadership obviously has some control about, and, and likewise in the House. Um, so I don't know that there's certainty as to sort of where this goes, but. If there is going to be a place where Congress does decide to pass legislation regulating social media, um, this would be it. Um, this is, you know, the closest thing to consensus among both parties, I think.
oil companies fueling investor optimism today. Both Exxon and Chevron raking in their second highest annual profits in a decade. To break it all down for us, let's bring in Yahoo Finance's Inez Frey. Inez, what were the big drivers? Yeah, that's right, Akiko. Well, a couple of standouts uh, during the last quarter. Of course, analysts had been expecting profits to be down from the 2022 fourth, fourth quarter, and they were, but they still exceeded expectations. So let's throw up some of the numbers for you. You had Chevron with an adjusted earnings per share of $3.45 topping analyst estimates by about 23 cents per share. You also had Exxon Mobil's adjusted earnings per share at 248, exceeding estimates by about 26 cents. What happened here? Well, they had higher output, more production. It was Chevron's case, talking about record annual worldwide and U.S. production in the U.S., production increasing by 14 percent. You also had Exxon Mobil, Guyana, and the Perm production was up 18 percent, also uh, talking about record annual refinery output. By the way, ExxonMobil's trading unit, uh, those profits were up by more than a billion dollars. ExxonMobil increasing its trading footprint, offsetting some of the lower crude prices that you saw in 2023. So, uh, bottom line is higher production, offsetting some of those crude prices that were down. Remember that WTI, West Texas in, uh, Intermediate, down more than 10 percent last year compared to the prior year. And then the third takeaway is increase in dividends, as usual with these uh, companies, with Sh Chevron announcing an 8 percent increase in quarterly dividend. ExxonMobil said that including their 4 percent increase in the fourth quarter dividend, the company has increased its annual dividend for 41 consecutive years. You're looking at XOM trading up almost 1 percent, Chevron up more than 3 percent, guys. And as you know, no surprise here when you consider where oil prices were, but we've had a number of analysts on that have talked about roughly $70 a barrel where they see it tracking. What does that outlook look like for some of these companies? Well, this is why analysts are paying such close attention to the acquisitions that were announced, uh, the Hess acquisition, the Pioneer acquisition, because this is going to allow these companies to expand even more so their footprint, uh, their output when it comes to crude and natural gas. And this has been their strategy, is expanding output to offset those declines in prices. And as for A, staying on top of the oil patch for us, thanks so much for that. Thank you. All your markets action ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
From its subscription concept to the rise of streaming, Netflix has built itself into a force in the entertainment industry. The company generated over $32 billion in revenue in 2023, including over 247 million subscribers worldwide. Beyond the Ticker takes a deep dive into the company's biggest moments. In 1997, Mark Randolph and Reed Hastings founded Netflix in Scotts Valley, California. Three years later, Netflix launched its monthly subscription concept. DVD rentals were mailed to customers, along with prepaid return envelopes. Later that year, Netflix was almost sold to Blockbuster for $50 million, but Blockbuster declined the offer. In 2002, Netflix launched its IPO, selling 5.5 million shares at $15 each. It brought in $82.5 million. Five years later, Netflix announced that it would debut streaming video while retaining its DVD rental service. Netflix stock fell to around $9 per share in November 2011 after the company revealed that it lost 800,000 subscribers in its third quarter. Two years later, Netflix released House of Cards, the beginning of Netflix's original programming. In 2015, Netflix shares surged to an all-time high, over $100 per share. That was growth of 574% over the prior five years. In 2017, a study by PwC showed that the Netflix subscriber base was now equal to the number of cable TV subscribers, 73% of all U.S. households. Four years later, Netflix launched its gaming platform Netflix Games, available on Android with five games at launch. The company also announced plans to expand its gaming service to iOS. In 2023, Netflix announced the wind down of DVD.com with its last shipment on September 29th. Another setback for Tesla, the EV maker recalling over 2 million vehicles in the U.S. over concerns around its warning lights. Now, this is the largest ever recall for the automaker, but by no means the first. Yahoo you know, Finance's Jared Blickery is here to break down how the stock historically moves on the back of these safety concerns. And Jared, we know that this is slightly different from a typical recall in the yes. sense that this is a, can be fixed over the air, but break down how the stock is reacting. Yeah, well, you can see it's a negative board for EV overall today, and that's been the case for the year and, for that matter, for the last year. But let's address this recall. Uh, the fix was already begun to uh, be deployed by Tesla on January 23rd, so it's been out there for some time. And you got to think uh, that the, given the fact that this was over the size of a font with regard to a warning light, uh, it's relatively easy to fix that. But it does highlight uh, and give the opportunity to present another problem Tesla has, and that's with, it, with its power steering program. Program. Uh, and a lot of complaints have been received by the National Highway Tra Traffic Safety Administration about this. And in fact, they initiated a probe into Tesla's power steering last year. And this was rec recently upgraded such that the NHTSA is now requiring an engineering report. That paves the way for a potential recall in the future. It's unknown whether that would be purely software related like the current recall and easily dispatched with or if it re would require owners bringing their Teslas in. Uh, but nevertheless, let's take a look at the stock and how things have shaped up this year. Tesla down 3% today. Let's take a look at the year-to-date totals for the EV space. You're going to notice not a lot of green here. Toyota Motors up 10%, GM7 along with uh, Volkswagen as well. But over the last, before I do that, let me just short, uh, sh uh, sort by performance here and show you that we have over half of these stocks down more than 20%. And that's only since the beginning of the year. You expand this to the last year, only Toyota Motors, Lee Auto, and KNDI in the green there, 1%. There we go, Candy Technologies. I'm not familiar with the name. Uh, but you can see about half of these have lost more than half of their value over the last year. That's an incredible total. A lot of these 80, 90%, so almost a total wipeout. Just shows you what's been going on with the space. And with regard to Tesla in particular, uh, Tesla's margins have been under pressure as the entire industries have. There's been disappointment, disappointment over the China reopening and other factors. Now this is a five-year chart of Tesla stock. And one thing that's standing out to me is that we are the very bottom end of this uh, trend 
channel. It's downward sloping, but this would be a logical place for a potential punt uh, if you were to target the upper end of that range. Now, I, I would say supplementary, supplementally, the 200-day moving average, the 50, the 20, all of those are sloping the wrong way, which is down, and the price is underneath all of those, so ideally I'd want to see that tick up. But 150 is also a giant target here. Uh, we have seen potential washouts before. I wouldn't be surprised if we go down and tag 150 before heading higher, but that's a technical setup, guys. And certainly tough timing, especially as we're looking at some softer EV demand as well. A big thank you to our very own Jared Blickery. Well, that does it for now. I'm Rochelle Akufa alongside Akiko Fujita. Thanks for watching Yahoo Finance. Stay with us.